Got our vote motion? Yeah, that's it. Quite right. Okay, and that's the only one we've received. That's correct. Okay. Uh, declarations of interest. I want to make a declaration of interest on item 17.5, which is the Queen's Jubilee Tree as a member of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, and on 17.7, uh, which is uh, will be self evident when we get to that point. Any other, uh, anybody else to make any uh, relevant financial or other interests at this stage? Yeah, thank you. There is no chair's business. Moving on to the draft minutes of proceedings. The draft minutes of the Finance Committee meeting on the 16th of February at page 8. Are members content with the draft? Our accurate record of proceedings? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, matters arising. There are no matters arising. Agreed. If we can uh, bring on us. Rachel, Nathan, and Christopher on Starleaf, please. They're actually here in person. Sorry, Chair. Oh, right. Okay. So, <clears throat> come on in. Chair, just before you start that, I'd like to make an observation. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I think we really are have to question why we're embarking on this item of business in respect of a draft budget, which has been effectively withdrawn, which never was the executive's budget in the first place. And we're spending the time of researchers and our own time uh, and purporting to do a report on a non on a non budget, and indeed having a debate about a non budget, that seems to me to be a total waste of time. And if it's about trying to give this budget credence so that um, direct role ministers or others might place reliance on it, then I think that only compounds the folly. Okay, thank you, Jim. Julie noted. Uh, welcome. Our next item on the agenda is the raised presentation on the 22-25 draft budget. Uh, we'll now receive a presentation from Rays and from Rachel, Nathan, and Christopher. And welcome to see you actually here, rather than at Starleaf. I think this is, uh, this is quite pleasant as well. Uh, I would like to draw members' attention to the following papers relating to the draft executive budget. Paper one on the public finance contact at page 19. Uh, paper two on the economic context at page 33. Page, paper three on capital investment at page 51 and paper four on departmental pressures on page 95, and the related correspondence from the Northern Ireland Fiscal Council at page 120. And I think what we'd probably like to do is focus on where the departmental pressures are, because look, we know we're, we know all the economic context and the rest of it, if we could do that as well. So welcome, and Rachel, are you uh, leading off, are you? Uh, I'll kick off. Over to you, please. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. Good afternoon uh, to you. We're here to present the four-part series addressing key themes arising from the draft executive budget 2022-25, which the now collapse executive had approved in December 2021 for consultation alone. Our plan is to make some uh, brief opening remarks on the series and then take questions at the end. The aim of the series is to promote openness and transparency in order to increase accountability in budget deliberations. So today we're going to focus mostly on papers three and four of the series. Mm -hmm. Paper three addresses capital investment within the context of the draft executive budget, and paper four explores departmental pressures as identified by each of the statutory committees within the context of the draft executive budget's identified funding. However, for context, I just want to make some brief remarks regarding Paper 1. Paper 1 sets out the context in which the draft executive budget arose and explains fundamental components of it. In particular, you may want to refer to Section 2 on page 23 of your PACs, which presents key factors impacting the formation of the draft executive budget. As you know, this is not a normal budget. The spending review triggered the, this process whereby the Minister of Finance created a three-year draft executive budget. However, the executive collapse then triggered something else, which has led to the situation we're in right now. You may also wish to refer to Section 3 of Paper 1 on page 30 of your PACs, which presents an illustrative example of the budgeting, budgeting process for Northern Ireland in 2017 in the absence of an executive. Shortly, I'm going to pass over to Chris, who will make some brief remarks on Paper 2 and then move on to Paper 4 and give us an overview of the overall resource and capital positions. We will then take each of the departments in turn and speak to the resource and capital positions of each, and we will do this by taking elements from both Papers 3 and 4. In addition, we will present the headline issues for each of the departments, which were identified by each of the committees and shared with us. Nathan will then wrap up with additional points we feel may be of use to the committee from Paper 3 concerning capital investment. So I'll pass over to Chris. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So, um, as you noted at the start, I won't dwell on the economic context, um, just to draw attention to it, really. Um, we included this basically to um, provide a little bit of context around the environment in which the draft budget was formed, um, and essentially it focuses on the recent performance of the economy um, and the outlook in terms of economic growth. Um, it looks at the labour market and the 
short-term outlook for it and then highlight some of the key uh, existing challenges and some of the more long-running um, issues the economy is facing. So we've included that just to provide some background and context to the, to the budget um, and the environment in which it was formed. Um, in terms of Paper 4, then, um, and the departmental pressures, um, this uh, starts with an overview of total financing identified in the, in, the, uh, in the draft executive budget and then looks at individual departmental pressures um, identified. So it looks at, the, looks at these in terms of resource and capital funding um, and looks at some of the areas that the committees um, identified as, as of interest or concern. Um, so we factored in departmental returns to the, their individual uh, corresponding committees in this as well. Um, so I'm going to look at the departments for infrastructure, communities and justice before passing back to Rachel um, and Nathan um, to cover the others and then look at paper three, if that's okay. Yep. So if we start with infrastructure, um, that should be on page 113 of your packs uh, in paper four. Um, and I'll touch on each of these points briefly. Um, so in terms of the resource and capital totals, um, we can see an increase each year um, mm. of the draft executive budget period relative to 21-22 uh, position. Um, infrastructure is unusual in that the capital um, total is larger than, than the resource, uh, just reflecting the nature of that department's work. Um, so when we spoke to or we contacted the committee to inquire about key issues, uh, relating to the budget, uh, and they identified three uh, key areas of concern or uh, interests. Um, so the first was that resource funding um, amounted to what they considered uh, uh, thought of as considerably less than what they bid for, um, and that they needed adequate resource um, funding to actually spend their capital budget. The second issue was that the capital funding um, awarded was also considerably less than what was bid for, um, and you'll see in table 15 of that table uh, of that paper um, that in 2024-25 the shortfall is close to 600 million um, in terms of capital. And then the third issue was around the funding provision for TransLink and NI Water. So the, uh, the committee stated some concern about the funding provision for those two um, bodies. Um, they also noted uh, a few key policy areas they wanted to see prioritised. So these included uh, NI Water, um, long-term investment in um, affordable public transport, road safety improvements, and some key road and rail projects such as the A5 and A6. Um, and at this point, it's worth referencing uh, Paper Three, um, which so on page 83 of the pack, we reference flagship projects, um, and there's a couple in particular that relate to DFI's um, responsibility. So these are the A5 the A6 and the Belfast Transport Hub. Um, so these are <coughs> three key flagship projects um, that we've noted in paper three. Um, as you'll also be aware, the draft investment strategy for Northern Ireland is out for consultation until April um, of this year. Um, again, this should be of relevance to um, the department's um, responsibilities. Um, in terms of communities, the Department for Communities, um, we look at this on page 115. Just to go back one, Obviously, one of the really significant issues is about Northern Ireland Water, and we have seen even in this committee every time that there's been a so it's nearly like an emergency funding request for Northern Ireland Water to keep it going, particularly to do with energy costs and mm -hmm. other issues. But structurally, it looks in a position where it's not particularly sustainable. So, has that been was that clearly identified by the Department for or the uh, Infrastructure Committee? That not only was this a sort of an issue going forward, as you look at the sort of the uh, sort of the drop down and sort of the increasing um, uh, resource or the re increasing requirement over the years, had they actually identified how much of that is particularly coming from sort of uh, Northern Ireland Water, or was that just a general sort of piece? Um, I wouldn't actually know off the top of my head. It's probably something that was included in the response. We got quite a lot of information back from the committee um, in their correspondence with the department. It's something um, we'll look into, or we can look into for the committee um, and identify. It's just that I think every time we've had, um, sort of, um, every time we've had a, a sort of a funding round that's come through, 
There's always been a sort of a pressure that has been identified. Everything we've seen through the COVID period and the rest of it, Northern Ireland Water has been there, and it's always been, you know, I need a million and a half for this, I need this, I need that, and whatever. And you know, we know the issues that TransLink are quite clear that was tied to that. But there seems to be something indeed fundamental about Northern Ireland Water that mm -hmm. I think is of a con should be of a concern. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, yes, so if I move on to the Department for Communities briefly, um, page 115 of the packs. So uh, we'll notice here that for the totals, um, resources lower in each year, again, of the executive budget period relative to 21 22, about 4% lower. Um, similar story for capital. Um, second year is slightly higher than the 21 22 position. So again, we reference paper three here and some of the flagship projects um, at page 83 of that third paper. Um, and the main point we have noted here is around uh, uh, regional stadia. So mm -hmm. there's 82 million um, identified for this in the draft executive budget for 22-25, um, with most of that, so 40 million a year um, in 23-24 and 24-25. Um, so only the regional stadia is listed um, mm -hmm. in this document. Um, there's no identified funding specifically mentioned for sub-regional um, in the current budget document. So um, we just wanted to draw um, attention to this. And really, there's, there's three things potentially of note here. Um, and that's that it may not be included because it's, it's not included because it's not yet got executive approval. Um, it did have exec or it was identified in the 2016-17 budget. Um, so we are not sure if you're aware that the, the minister would have confirmed then on Monday that they were both executive flagship projects. Yeah, they did. the minister Which, did categorically state yeah. that they were both executive flagship projects. Yeah. But there isn't money allocated against that that you can find? Uh, not identified in the current uh, budget document. So it's a, obviously a bit of an ongoing issue. Um, and we've noticed that, or we've noted that um, one of the potential reasons for this is the timing of um, what's been called a refresh and re-engagement exercise um, that's obviously taken place since the initial allocation in 2016-17. Um, so um, further benchmarking and research um, was cited as one of the reasons. So um, that was noted by the minister on the 15th of October um, in plenary. So we just we wanted to draw attention to that as an ongoing issue. Um, okay. And then finally for myself, in terms of the Department of Justice, so um, we've looked at the resource total and we can see a decrease in each year of the budget uh, period relative to 21-22, but a slight increase in capital terms. Um, so when we spoke to the committee um, when doing this piece of work, um, the main area of concern they identified was the, well generally that they noticed that this, or noted that this was a difficult budget uh, for them, um, and particularly in terms of the PSNI, um, given that it just accounts for such a large percentage of the overall budget for the department. Um, so that concludes the three departments I'm going to cover in terms of departmental pressures, and I'll pass back over to Rachel. OK, Rachel, over to you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, first of all, I'm going to focus on the Department of Health in section 2.4 of paper 4, starting on pages 109 of your packs. Um, so as you know, health was identified as one of the key priorities of the draft executive budget. The amount of resource Dell and capital Dell identified within uh, the budget document for the Department of Health is detailed in, page, uh, in table 11 on page 109. Mm -hmm. As Chris stated, the funds identified for the Department of Health in the draft executive budget represent more than half of the overall executive budget. The draft executive budget document identifies resource Dell of £664 million to be spent at the discretion of the Minister. And in, in addition to this, the Secretary of State confirmed £49 million of transformation resource Dell funding is to be made available under the New Decade New Approach political agreement for each year of the draft executive budget from 2022 until 2025. Um, in terms of capital funding, the draft executive budget documents 313 million of capital Dell to be spent at the discretion of the minister. And in addition to this, there's a small allocation of 0 0.4 million for in 2022-23 as part of the city deals funding, and 36.3 million for flagship projects. Mm -hmm. uh, funding for all of the flagship projects is outlined in Table 14 of Paper 3, which is on page 83 of your packs. And the two that concern the Department of Health or the mother and Children's Hospital and the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service Training Centre. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we reached out to each of the committees um, to get uh, to gauge sorry. how. Hey, come, come on in now. Sorry. Yeah, yes, thanks, Chair. Just uh, sorry for interrupting you. No it's a bit flow there. Apart from the health budget, what, what's that gone up uh, percentage ways? It's shown, is it five here in resource? On, look, at a look at a table 11 uh, under 2.4. Yeah, the, so is that, that an average of sort of five? I haven't looked into this figure yet, but is it roughly five percent? Yeah, we've looked at the percentage increase from the 2021-22 budget allocation. Some of the increases reported have been in terms of the baseline. So I think it was reported as 10 percent from baseline, but it's five percent from the 2021-22 budget allocation. And I don't know why you have an opinion on this or not, but I'm going to ask you: Is it the Department of Health in a position to, to manage that additional money effectively? Um, it, it's not really for us to state um, sort of analysis of what they're going to do with the money. I know that there have been a couple of reports produced by the Department of Health yeah. um, uh, concerning elective care, yeah. um, and that's one of their priorities and also one of their concerns. So there, there is a report on elective care which quotes sort of quite large numbers on what would be needed to deal with, for example, the waiting list crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, and the allocation within the draft executive budget is a lot lower than what has been reported. Um, I also know that they have a report produced on the transformation funding, and they um, published an updated report sort of in, in December of last year um, in terms of what the money is actually going to be used for. But at, at this point in time, they've been allocated um, money to be used at the discretion of the Minister. And one final question, if I may, Chair. So that's a 5% jump from... 21-22 to 22-23 on mm -hmm. resource. Yep. Then the next jump, what's that? Is that just what percentage jumps from 22-23 up to 20, you know, the next two financial years? I, I haven't actually done the calculation for the, the next two jumps. So is it is it? It's not another five percent. Obviously, it wouldn't be five percent. No, it wouldn't be. No, it would. The calculations would have been done off the baseline, okay. so it wouldn't be as much as five percent. No. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Sure. Thanks very okay. much. Oh, just a quick one. One of the questions we've had, obviously, from the Department of Health has been uh, looking forward, because of, obviously we don't have a budget, which mm -hmm. is the real concern, and we don't know what it's doing. Mm -hmm. But if we have to go back to the sort of 45 per cent, the question is of the baseline. One of the things that's been put to me by people from the Department of Health, maybe the Minister himself, mm -hmm. is you know, we're not quite sure what the baseline is, mm -hmm. because we haven't had that done. What baseline figure are you looking at? For these for these calculations, uh, we we've done our calculations off the 2021-22 budget, but the baseline that we would have looked at, sort of in previous papers, would have been from the spending review, right? Um, and that doesn't include any non-recurring funding. Okay, thanks, Richard. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, just in terms of the Department of Health, we asked them to outline headline issues, and they came, the committee can committee <coughs> come back to us with waiting lists as one of the issues, the transformation agenda, workforce planning, and also the COVID-19 recovery. So, moving on to the Executive Office in Section 2.5, oh. which starts on page 112 of your packs. The Alicia, do you want to come in now? No, that's quite right. Okay, the amount of resource Dell and capital Dell identified within the draft executive budget for the executive office is detailed in Table 12 um, on page 112. The draft, draft executive budget document identified 13 million of resource Dell to be spent at the discretion of the minister. And in addition to this, there's 138 million of ring fenced resource Dell that has been identified. And this significant increase is due to the requirement to administer three areas of funding relating to historical institutional abuse redress payments, victims payment scheme, and the truth recovery program. In terms of capital funding, the uh, Budget document identifies capital Dell of 15 million to be spent at the discretion of the minister, and the committee has confirmed that this is mostly associated with urban villages projects. So the executive office uh, committee highlighted uh, a couple of headline issues for us. Uh, firstly, victims payments. Uh, secondly, project management. Uh, thirdly, strategic investments that they have, and fourthly, sustainability of projects funded under certain programs. So next, I'm going to turn. So I just go back, Richard. So project management, mm -hmm. and obviously this is uh, how the executive office tends to take over through their favourite friends, the strategic investment board, at every available opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, these particular things as well. What is the particular concern from a budgetary perspective? 
they just highlighted a sort of an area of, of interest to that committee that they keep an eye on. Um, they explained that they typically um, undertake projects at short notice, so I guess the funding isn't available at the start of the budget cycle. It becomes available during the year, and then they're responsible for administering that funding and, and running a project. And one of the concerns that they had was the setting up of actual project teams in terms of capacity, and there may not be capacity at all times to set up a project that they're not initially aware of. All right. Okay. Um, so moving on to the Department of Finance, and um, this is covered in section 2.9 of paper 4, which starts on page 118 of your packs. So the amount of resource DEL and capital DEL identified within the draft executive budget for the Department of Finance is detailed in, table, uh, in the table on page 118 of your packs. The table shows that resource DEL identified within the draft executive budget is marginally lower uh, than the resource DEL allocation presented in the 2021-22 executive budget, uh, given the relatively small size size of the Department of Finance budget in monetary terms, this equates to a difference of only 3.6 million. In terms of capital funding, uh, the draft executive budget document identifies capital DEL of 35 million to be spent at the discretion of the minister. And uh, there were four headline issues that were highlighted um, by, by yourselves. Um, firstly, the expected variation in staff costs. Excuse me, just a second, Rachel. What's integrate? Sorry, what? Integrate. I know what LPS Nova System is. I know what NI Digital oh, Integrate. Content. No, they, they've told. Oh, we know this. Oh, I know the answer to this one. Um, this is the replacement for uh, HR Connect and Account NI. I believe this is the new all singing, all dancing um, replacement for those old systems, which are now out of date. So that's why they call it Integrate. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Uh, sorry. I just. I, I was just nodding there, sagely as you were going through. Yeah, I got that. I got that. It's Integrate. I didn't know. So. Um, yeah. So the the four issues identified for the Department of Finance were the expected variation in staff costs, unfunded pressures during 2022-25 for Reval 2023, uh, some of the capital projects that they're running, and. Um, just the, if, uh, an absence of COVID-19 uh, funding for future support for businesses. So I'll now pass over to Nathan to talk through the three re uh, remaining ministerial departments. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Um, are we looking at the Department of Education? Uh, it, it Ethan, is, is this the first time you've been in front of the committee? Yes, it is. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> thank you very welcome, much. Welcome Chair. to the committee. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, so I'll be looking at the Department of Education. It is uh, 2.1, uh, page 100 of your packs. Um, the baseline figure uh, resource deal presented in the draft executive budget presents an estimated resource deal funding gap of $204,249,309,000 and for each year of the draft budget that has been calculated. Uh, in particular, draft budget highlights ring fenced uh, proposed funding of $22 million in each year of the budget for addressing food poverty and school holiday food grants. Uh, the variance in the cattle bid for the department uh, and the amount identified in the draft budget uh, ranges from almost 60 million to over 122 million uh, under the proposed bids. Uh, when we contacted the department for or the committee for education, uh, issues of particular interest include uh, COVID safety and resourcing uh, of schools, continuity in education, special needs uh, provision, uh, children and young people's emotional and mental health and issues surrounding equal opportunities in education. Uh, this includes uh, underachievement by young men, period poverty and impacts on attendance, morale and equal opportunities for young women. Partition Can I just say, you said period poverty? Yes. So the Department of Education has identified that the funding lies with them? In for the pilot, sorry. For the pilot, yeah. but not for the, no. not for the full project? That's okay, sorry. Um, Yes, uh, participation in STEM by young women, uh, good careers advice and visible options after leaving school. Um, moving over to the Department for the Economy, uh, it's page 103 of your packs, uh, mm -hmm. 2.2. The, uh, economy in the Department of the Economy, in response to the draft executive budget, provided the committee with a financial model where potential savings could be made over the budget period. Uh, the areas identified include reduction in higher education places, an increase in student fees, a reduction in apprentice, apprentices and cease of all higher level apprenticeships, ceasing the student support grant and the education maintenance allowance and ceasing new business at Invest in I. Um, in terms of uh, financial transaction capital, DFE is to receive a total of just over 25 million across the budget period. 
Uh, the Department of the Economy received the bulk of the identified funding in the draft of ex executive budget for the city and growth deals, uh, 268.8 million, from a total uh, for the city and growth deals of 315.9 million. Uh, additionally, the department will lead in three projects identified in the city and growth deals complementary fund, uh, including the Balamina Integrated Green Hydrogen Hub, the Hydrogen Technologies Accelerator Hub and the Industrial Investment Challenge Hub and Digital Transformation Fund, uh, which all have complementary funding of the sum of 28.5 million. Uh, the issues expressed by the committee are the potential secession of new business at Invest in I, mm -hmm. the impact of loss of EU structural funds, and uh, funding for the newly published Energy Strategy Action Plan, as well as upcoming skill strategy, and the possibility of a knock-on impact on the review of further and higher education and the development of the 1419 strategy uh, with the Department uh, of Education. Uh, the final department I'm moving on to is the uh, Department for Art, Culture, Environment and Rural Affairs, uh, page 106 in your pack. Uh, in reference to the resource pressures, um, the era submitted bids totaling an additional 2.24.3 million over the course of the next uh, three fin uh, financial years, in which the draft <coughs> executive bu uh, budget uh, indicatively allocated 50.7 million. This equates to 23% of the, the bid. Uh, that the department had made. In terms of capital outside their own general allocations in green growth funding, uh, the department would lead in the White Spots Country Park as part of the Belfast City Day, receiving 7.4 million uh, complementary fund allocation for that project. Uh, in terms of issues identified by the committee, uh, the long-term facilitation of funding for direct farm payments following EU exit, uh, resourcing of the rural development programs in the years ahead, uh, the sufficiency of funding to deliver the green growth and climate change agenda. Uh, the uh, department has informed the committee uh, that the department will bid with 600 million for this purpose. Uh, however, that was over a five-year period rather than three of the of the budget of the draft budget. Uh, in the draft budget, 304 was allocated for green growth, uh, of which the Department of Agriculture is to receive 137.2 million of that. Um, they also raised issues in terms of the cost associated it with facilitating EU exit. Uh, Deere sought a total uh, of approximately 33 million uh, to facilitate the department's requirements under EU exit. However, only one, one million per annum is, has been provided for this purpose in, in the draft budget. Uh, they also are concerned with significant reductions in revenue and capital funding, uh, impacting the department's implication of key initiatives. Uh, uncertainties regarding EU, 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 EU replacement funding, and finally, uh, potential challenges arising uh, to continue the farm business improvement scheme. Um, so that concludes the uh, departmental section of the paper. Um, so I'd like to move on just to bring a few points on paper three. Um, and to avoid any duplication, uh, as we just discussed some of the capital investment projects, I'll just focus on areas that may not have been fully covered in the previous yep. uh, thing. So, uh, you know, the draft executive budget provides capital funding of 5.23 billion over the three-year period. Um, after the Chancellor's spending review in 2021, the Secretary of State confirmed funding available from a number of financial packages contributing to the draft executive budget. These include the Fresh Start Capital Dell for shared education housing, which we receive $106.9 million. The confidence supply package for the ultra-fast broadband is $86.6 million. A new deck and new approach package for the graduate entry medical school will receive $15 million over the draft executive budget period. Um, additionally, in section 5 of paper 3, uh, we look more closely at the UK central administrative funds that will be available over the draft executive budget period. Uh, as the committee may be aware, the UK government uh, published its leveling up white paper mm -hmm. uh, during the consultation period in, on the 2nd of February. Um, included in the paper references to two previously announced funds in which money will be made available for capital investment in Northern Ireland. Uh, these include the Leveling Up Fund and the Share Prosperity Fund. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the Leveling Up Fund, uh, a to the total of the total available, the percentage split between the devolved nations will be 9% for Scotland, 5% for Wales and 3% uh, for Northern Ireland. Uh, this equated to 80, 800 million of the total funding available for uh, Leveling Up. Uh, between 2021 and 2024-25. In the first tranche of that funding, 
1.7 billion has been allocated and has already stated 3% is available for Northern Ireland. There were 11 successful bids in Northern Ireland for that funding, uh, which accounted for 2.9%, so just 0.1% under the 3% po possibly allocated. Uh, at the same time as the white paper was published, additional guidance was published in relation to the Share Prosperity Fund, in which the UK government announced 2.6 funding available by March 2025. Uh, this will be a mixture of both revenue and capital. Notably, areas of the UK will receive an allocation from the fund via formula rather than by competition. Mm -hmm. Specifically in Northern Ireland, the UK government will have oversight of the fund and they plan to draw on the expertise of local partners, but it will be led by the UK government. Uh, an investment plan will be applied at Northern Ireland wide level rather than local government level, uh, which, is unlike, which is unlike the case in England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, the UK government intends that this plan will include specific rules for partners, including Northern Ireland executive, local authority, city and growth deal geographies, business and community voluntary sector. Um, I'll just briefly look at the draft uh, investment strategy um, for Northern Ireland. Uh, published again during the consultation period of the draft executive budget on the 26th of January. Uh, the proposed strategy takes a 30-year approach up to 20, 20, 2050. Uh, the scale investment in terms, uh, in real terms, will be required will be significantly higher uh, than the 1.24 to 1.1.2 to 1.4 billion typically invested for the last 10 years, according to the, the strategy. Uh, to provide more long-term planning, the draft strategy suggests it will introduce a medium infrastructure finance plan that will be developed to help inform departmental uh, capital planning going forward. Uh, the intention of the, in, the initial executive uh, infrastructure investment plan uh, and finance plan should, was to be delivered by the end of 2022 and cover the period to 2032, uh, reflecting both existing commitments and new uh, investment programmes for that period. Uh, finally, just to turn to section eight of the paper, which looks at uh, reinvestment and, re and reform initiative borrowing. RI borrowing provides uh, the means to, to supplement the executive's capital budget. Uh, up to 21-22 financial year, the total RI borrowing the executive availed of since uh, RI was enabled uh, was 3.163 billion. Of that figure, the amount outstanding to be repaid in both principal and investment repayment stood at 1.569 billion at the end of 21-22. Uh, the draft executive budget includes borrowing of 1, uh, 140 million in 22-23, 194 in 23-24, and 200 in 24-25. Uh, this is the, the, the total of RI borrowing over the budget period will be 534 million. Uh, the maximum allowable of the 200 million will be borrowed in the final year of the draft executive budget. Um, I'll conclude there, Chair. Um, thank you for listening to the presentation, and I'll make way for questions from the committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Lee, and uh, well done. Thank you. Time the front of the committee. Okay. Lisa. Uh, well, thank, thank you, all for like, you're all very welcome. Uh, just a, a few questions in relation to sort of the general presentation, and that. Uh, to what extent was his uh, draft budget aligned with other sort of key strategic do documents in relation to the programme for government or the green growth strategy and or the draft investment strategy? We've actually tried to cover that um, in paper one, um, which provides sort of context to the programme for government, which is still in draft form. Um, the executive also had um, specific strategic documents to do with COVID, the COVID response and the COVID recovery. And there's some overlap between the COVID recovery leading into the programme for government. <coughs> uh, some of the, um, if I just turn to actually page one or paper one, um, some of the things reported within the COVID recovery uh, were to do with health and green growth and things like that. But the strategy of this of the draft executive budget seems to be mostly to do with health. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So in fact, it's, uh, it is aligned down to to the program for government and that as well. Uh, well, health is one of the um, strands of programme for government, but I think yeah. we're at the stage of we're in reco COVID recovery, which leads into the programme for government, but health is one of the key strands yeah. of that. And just another area that was alluded to there, just um, uh, in terms of uh, the Department of the Economy, where they're reporting a gap of 67.2 million resource there. Um, to what extent is the loss of the EU structural funds? Um, uh, and skills and education contributing to the shortfall. 
Uh, or are there other reasons maybe that has given rise to that? Um, I'm not sure if they made specific reference to the you know, necessarily the loss of some you know the structural funds as a reason for the gap. Um, so it would be difficult to attribute it to just that. Um, that be fair. I mean, well, obviously every department had a two percent reduction overall, um, so we don't know where or two percent efficiencies uh, Ooh. overall. Ooh. <laughs> um, so we don't know where those what they're attributed to because many of the um, identified funds within the draft executive budget were at the discretion of a minister. So we, we don't know specifically in what area they would relate to. Yeah. So in fact. You don't have an assessment of the impact, say, of the loss of the EU structural funds? Not within these set of papers. Um, that, would, that would be a substantial piece of work on, you know, a separate piece of work probably to, to, to carry out to actually assess the economic impact of a, of a change in funding like that. Okay. And uh, the Minister of Finance had referenced 200 million of funding which is available for allocation in the next financial year. And to what extent would this 300 million alleviate some of the pressures identified by departments? Um, to what, sorry, to what extent would the 300 million alleviate pressure? Pressure. The departments yeah, already um, identified by the departments and so on. Yeah, I mean, in nearly all the, in fact, probably in all of the responses or correspondence we had with committees um, in relation to pressures. Um, they all identified some or made some reference to the fact that it was a difficult budget for them or so you know any any additional funding like that where you know up to even if it was three hundred million is going to make a difference or would, would make a difference or alleviate pressure um, because all the departments and committees made note of the fact that you know they all had pressure somewhere um, in some area of the remit. So um, you know, but re really it would extent, be at the discretion of the minister where the, the funding was going to go to, so it wouldn't yeah. be up to us to sort of, um, we've identified the pressures that the, the departments have identified to their committees, but it would be up to the minister where the allocation would be made. And it's crucial just that it is allocated uh, in the very first instance. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Thanks, Thank you, Chair. Rachel, Tim, in big handfuls, what are the overall pressures in a figure? Um, there is actually a figure, isn't there? Do, do you have the overall one? Yeah, bear with me. Two seconds. And we know it's more than 300 million, but I just wanted to know how much the delta is. Um, so, in terms of resource Dell, um, if we look at the 2021 22 budget allocation total for the nine ministerial departments, you've got a figure of 13 billion. Um, do we actually have the delta? Not all of the departments give us monetary figures for pressures. Yeah, that's, that's, so yeah. we have areas that each of the departments would like to look at, and some of the departments provided monetary figures, but we, we don't have an overall figure for pressures um, yeah. because we haven't got them from all of the departments, which is why we haven't reported on it. But we could certainly uh, try and find out if that, that would be. That, I think that would be a very useful figure to have. The other interesting thing is when we had the uh, fiscal council was in before us, they said one of the really difficult things was to tie in what is quite woolly aspirations within the previous programme for government and actually ascribe it to an outcome that actually had sort of some kind of financial line against it, so you could monitor it. So, and if we look at sort of the outcomes based from the programme for government we've had before. It's very difficult to tie that into a specific budget line and where that pressure lies. Mm -hmm. So we know that there isn't a programme for government at the moment. We know there was some kind of nebulous draft that hasn't got very far. But we also know, again, because we've heard it from the Fiscal Council as well, there isn't any sort of lines against particular projects. But the only thing that is there is health so that we know that health is being given sort of everybody needs to make a two percent efficiency to make sure health gets the money it needs to do to transformation that is about it from the entire thing am i correct and would that be a sort of surmisation that you would come from 
in an ideal world, the uh, programme from government would come before the budget and the budget would be based on that, but this budget hasn't been based on that because we don't have a programme for government. Um, so some of the overall agreed executive priorities were health um, and obviously rating and, and borrowing. Uh, so those are sort of the three emerging themes from this draft executive budget. Yeah, because it's interesting, of course, that they, again, because we haven't agreed the draft investment strategy yet, so we're putting all things are they're all in sort of like this sort of very strangely shaped, shaped Venn diagram that don't quite overlap, where we're trying to get some sort of coherence to be able to go forward for sort of some form of draft budget for the for the next three years. Do you feel, particularly because we started asking for sort of the uh, mem memorandum and sort of the budgetary memorandum from the various departments, is that help given a bit of, I hate to use the word, but I'll use it anyhow, granularity? To where we're trying to get to. Yes, I absolutely think that would be helpful, sort of going forward to see. Uh, but that's sort of looking at, um, pa you know, backward after the money has already been spent. If we're looking at memorandums of understanding at that point, um, but uh, yeah, I think going forward, the more detail that we have, the better. But this, we also need to think about the timeline to do with the budget, which we covered <coughs> in paper one. You know, it's yeah. it's based on the spending review. You know, we, we had a three-year budget based on the spending review and the timeline to do with the spending review. So there were issues with sort of the timeline to do with the formulation of the draft executive budget as well. So, you know, there wasn't an investment strategy in place and there wasn't a programme for government in place. Because curiously, we're not going to in the situation, even with the best will in the world, we're going to be a year behind the three-year budget, behind, behind without, if everything, you know, mm -hmm. everything goes swimmingly, not that I think it will, but if it did, we're still a year behind where we should be on a sort of three year budget on the three year budget. We're already a year into it. Mm -hmm. But we haven't got any strategy around it. Uh, the the current strategy of this budget was to just to do sort of with health. So to do with health. Okay. Okay. And sort of if you could look at what the as as well as you can, if you could let us know what the delta is between what is available and what the sort of um, everybody's pressures are, and I know some of the pressures we can't put sort of um, a sort of a, a value beside the rest of it. Tim, any other questions? Yeah, just one quick oh, question. Go ahead, Keith. May I ask what time you spent on this document? And that doesn't reflect the quality of it. I mean, I mean, uh, you know, how many totality people are, or should they say, are manners, whatever the term is now? Um, this is something we actually yeah. will discuss later today when we submit sort of to our database. Um, we'll each submit ours that we've worked on this, and then it will be um, correlated with our SRO, and then we'll have an overall number for the amount of hours that have actually been spent on this. So we could. Is it, are you talking roughly a week per person? Um, is it more? Is it less? We work at, on multiple yeah. different things at the same time, so it's sort of, uh, you know, if we're reaching out to departments or reaching out to committees for information, you know, that, that maybe takes an hour, and then we don't get the information back for a while, and then, you know, we worked on multiple projects at the same time, but I'd yeah. say probably more than a week. So, yeah, probably, yeah. But Something I, I will add up after of. this. But. We, we could get back to you if that's okay. No, just, just get the nod there. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, so with apart from that, Rachel, Nathan, Christopher, thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed for your first time in front of the committee. Thank you, sir. And hopefully we'll have enough committees around <laughs> for you to come back to. <laughs> okay, team, okay, great work. Thank, thank you. you very much indeed. Okay. So, team, apart from the request on the, on the Delta issue between the uh, requirements, uh, the pressures, and the budget, any other actions from that? Northern Ireland Water and oh, yes. inability of their structure and their funding yeah. is what you're asking about? Yeah, because there's obviously concerns about it, but we probably need to get a bit more clarity on that. Okay. okay. Next item on the agenda, draft committee compilation report on the 22-25 budget. And we've heard what Jim said. Uh, the committee will now be asked to agree a compilation report on, on the other statutory committee scrutiny of the impact of the 22-25 budget on their respective departments. Uh, the briefing note at page 123. Actually, it's a very good briefing note, um, Peter. Well done. Uh, letter to the statutory committees on page 124. Draft report on page 126, and each of the statutory committees' response on page 135. Peter, do you want to say? 
So, Chair, thanks. Um, other committees have given their views on the draft budget. Uh, in short, as sort of to give you a synopsis of what you just heard from our raise, the TEO is concerned about the historical institutional abuse inquiry on victims' pensions and where the money will come for all of that. Uh, agriculture and economy um, have identified unmet pressures, including things like EU replacement funding and Invest Northern Ireland. Infrastructure communities and education have significant unmet pressures. Justice Minister has indicated she will not be supporting the budget because of the, the pressures that they're facing there. Uh, the Health Committee did not have time to scrutinise uh, because of the vast volume of, of um, legislation that they have been, an important legislation that they've been considering. Um, but it isn't entirely clear in respect of the, the detail of the milestone plan for health spending in 22-25. We know about elective care. Um, but the actual numbers, num money available in the budget and the money required there don't exactly match. Um, so those are the views of other committees. They're not your views, um, but there are those views of those committees, uh, and those committees have signed off on those. Uh, the Finance Committee would then be publishing these in order to inform a debate. And as I say, those views would not necessarily be members' views. You might well take a very different position, but uh, you would publish this uh, report in order to inform um, other members' contributions to said debate. Okay. Members and comments? Okay. Thank you. Therefore, are we, is the committee content with the compilation report, title page, introduction, committee approach sections and appendices as drafted? Is this agreed? Agreed. agreed. Is the committee content to share the report with all MLAs via SharePoint as soon as possible and publish it on our web page subsequently? Agreed. Will we be calling a few reinforce and asking it to be printed? Uh, I don't know who would print it. There, we don't have a printing contract anymore. So, uh, yeah, I know that the members. I understand there was a debate a week ago where members struggled to find the report. So, I'm going to send it via the SharePoint, but it'll also get the library if they will agree to um, circulate it to members as well. So, there's two ways you can get it. Um, so, there was a particular report that I think members were struggling yes, to please, see. Yes, please, because it's it's the only place I've actually seen everywhere where the pressures are what the committee's views are and within the budget. It's the one place that's all been brought together. I think the committees did a good job, actually. The different uh, committees yeah, actually did. did a really good job in there. So, but uh, yeah, so but no, nothing's actually printed out anymore. Members were all electronic. But I will ensure, do my very best to get that to MLAs by a number of different routes so okay. you have a chance to see it in advance. OK, team. Uh, the, member, the minister has indicated informally that in light of the legal advice on progressing a budget and the subsequent pause in the budget consultation process, he believes that there is limited value in holding a take note debate on the draft 22-25 budget, but in closed session I have outlined the reason why I think we should. However, should the committee wish to proceed, he indicated that he will, of course, attend. I think it is important that we do have discussed this discussion. Yes. Are we agreed? Agreed. 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 Uh, members may also wish to note the Minister advised that perhaps £300 million of resource Dell will be carried over to 2225, and this may have an effect on some of the unfunded pressures identified by statutory committees. We have already asked for raise for that information, and we'll, we'll, in light of that, we'll circulate that information as well. It's just sorry to, to advise members that I think, as either uh, Mr. McHugh or, or yourself were saying, that some of those pressures would probably be met by the 300 million, but some of them really wouldn't. It would take wouldn't take much of a bite out of what education are looking for and what communities are looking for. But in terms of economy and infrastructure, I would have thought the 300 million would have gone quite a long way. Yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, anyway. Okay. Hi, Matthew. Uh, okay, uh, sir. In the light of the recent note from the speaker, the minister also suggests that the committee may also wish to consider if the motion might be considered non-essential. I don't consider it non-essential, and I don't think it should be delayed to the next mandate because who knows when the next mandate will occur. Okay. Any other panelists? Any comments? No. Do we wish to have this debate? I think we do. Agreed. Agreed. Moving on to the next item of the agenda is John and Ronan available? Are they coming up at Starley? Uh, Ronan is. Okay. Team, the next uh, item on the agenda is the nearly zero energy buildings regulation. The committee will now receive an oral briefing from the department and officials on draft changes to guidance on building regulations in respect of domestic and non-domestic zero energy buildings, NZEB. There we go. Hi, John. How are you? Hi, Ron. Um, hello. Hello. Um, I'm hoping you can um, see me okay. Yeah, we can indeed. Yeah. Okay. Everything's everything's coming through. Okay. I'm a bit, Good. Um, excellent. Seem uh, quite grainy on my, on my screen. There seems to be a bit of a delay. Would okay. you be okay if I provide an opening statement, Chair? Uh, just one second. 
Uh, team, the uh, clerk's briefing paper is at page 210. The departmental briefing is at page 219. And a response of the consultation from the Construction Employers Federation is page 455. Uh, John Ronan, welcome to the committee. We are inviting you to the meeting to provide members with an oral briefing on draft changes to guidance on building regulations in respect of domestic and non-domestic near, nearly zero energy buildings. And is it John, you making the opening statement? Yeah, I will do that if that is okay. Okay, over to you. Okay, so um, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the clerk for bringing our papers to you and for the committee for tabling so promptly. It is very helpful. Uh, so I'm here as the head of uh, Building Regulations Unit 2, which has been uh, concentrating on this work, and my colleague Ronan Casey is here, having carried out much of the energy modelling and collation of some of the consultation responses. Um, you will recall back in June 2021, we brought draft consultation proposals to the committee and discussed them with you. Uh, these were finalised and published on the 11th of October 2021, with the consultation period closing after 10 weeks on the 19th of December. The consultation proposes to amend the department's technical booklet guidance to Part F of the building regulations. Part F attends to the conservation of fuel and power and applies to set minimum standards for buildings when building work is being carried out. There are no legislative proposals here, but the guidance will redefine the standards that operate in practice. The context is one where really very significant and rapid developments are taking place in other regions. And the proposals here provide only a, a, an interim step while the department considers such wider developments. The department has provided an outline programme of potential further phased steps as part of the energy strategy work. We are also conscious that more robust technical guidance, more robust guidance will be more help, will, would be helpful in the very short term to support our current regulation 43B, which transposed new build, nearly zero energy building requirements of the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive. So the proposals focus on new build standards, as this is the area where we are particularly behind the other regions and because this is where NZEB requirements apply. The consultation proposals have been developed through extensive and detailed engagement with the Department's Building Regulations Advisory Committee and a Part F Technical Subcommittee, which included diverse representation from stakeholders. The uplift, first of all, seeks to improve the minimum basic fabric standards of some and some service standards so that they should be broadly in line with the <coughs> current average new build today. And secondly, resets the performance required under the current modelled emissions assessment requirement. The emissions reset is calibrated so that for most buildings, we expect a proportion of their energy requirements may be delivered by on-site renewables, such as photovoltaic arrays, heat pumps, or other lower carbon solutions. Mm -hmm. Striking the balance in this emissions reset is probably the most difficult aspect of the proposals. So we, we consulted on three options around this. Option one is do nothing. This was not really supported. Option two had emissions betterments of 25% for all dwelling types and 15% for other buildings. Option three had emissions betterments of 40% for houses, 25% for flats, and 15% for other buildings. And this was the preferred option with a very strong majority support from consultation respondents. I, I should declare, and we need to be careful here, because the likely betterment at actual reductions, so the, the 40, 25, 15%, et cetera, are likely to be some way less than, than those percentage figures as the current methodologies, which we intend to retain for now, do not reflect the recent and ongoing decarbonisation of the electricity grid. The reasons for the variable degrees of betterment, 40, 25 and 15% between building types, are articulated in the consultation documents, but relate to the fact that fabric improvements deliver a lower percentage betterment in large compact building than in a building with a more exposed envelope, such as a detached house. The draft papers before you propose publishing the new technical guidance in conformity with option three and to come into effect from the 30th of June this year. We recognise that this is faster than the normal six month lead in from publication to implementation, but we believe that this is reasonable given the length of time since the last substantial uplift in 2012 and because an NZEB related uplift has been anticipated for some time. We plan to move quickly to continue with awareness raising activity in coming weeks to support this. We are trying to balance impacts and risks with the pressures to progress quickly towards much more significant net zero standards for new bills. It's worth emphasising that recent proposals from England, published in December and coming into effect in June, the same time as our proposals, go a lot further than our consultation. 
there, these will also provide a more up-to-date uh, emissions um, and energy assessment methodology, which we expect to later adopt here. This further tips the balance towards the more progressive option three that we put forward, as we are likely to have to adopt measures very similar to those now coming through in England if our local carbon reduction obligations are to be met. Mm -hmm. The uplift will apply only to new applications made from the 30th of June, so the impact will phase in over subsequent years as current applications build out. An impact assessment has been produced. June. Like Sorry, most, just, just uh, one, John. this June. Yes. An impact assessment has been produced. Like most economic assessment methods, it is based on limited assumptions, but it does point to significant overall benefits uh, from the measures, albeit with impacts on developers. Finally, I think it's just worth noting again that other than in some very limited cases of material change of use, building regulations only apply when work is done. So these proposals will apply principally to new build situations, typically assumed to be less than 1% of the existing stock and perhaps less than 0.3% of the existing emissions from buildings per year. This is not a retrofit programme, but it should help improve skills and influence the common expectations in that regard. I appreciate that there's quite some detail in the consultation packages and in the papers before you. Um, so I expect it's best to explore this through questions or comments you might have, and uh, if I might close my opening statement at, at, at that, if that's helpful. Okay, thanks. Just a quick, just one. I notice when you're sort of you're discussing one of the issues we were talked about, sort of with uh, sort of connection and connection to the grid. I know John O'Dowd has recently withdrawn his private members bill, but one of the questions that uh, when we were supporting John O'Dowd's, and I regret that he is removing his private members bill. One of the questions we had was of the exorbitant cost of connection uh, being charged by NIE for virtually anybody who tries to get on the grid, particularly in comparison to the rest of our nation. And it just seems absolutely ridiculous that there, you know, people are paying sort of two or three times for the same amount of labour and cabling that they would be paying for in Scotland or in sort of the north of England. So uh, looking at that, what views did you have about sort of that particular aspect of it? Because you know it is when we try to sort of reduce considerably the amount of emissions that we have, and buildings become, to use the terminology, more self-sustaining environmentally and energy effectiveness. But they do need to have that route to the grid. So, what was your particular perspectives on that? So this was. Uh, not a, this wasn't an issue when we when we first started out on this path, perhaps uh, you know two years ago, but it was certainly quickly highlighted to us. So, with that with that in mind, the level of of improvement that we have proposed, um, it, first of all, I suppose it's essential to say you know, a new a new property building you know today on the current standards, um, wherever it may be may face certain costs um, and that is really a matter for DFE and for the utility regulator and, and Northern Ireland networks and as to how they um, as to how that whole system works and, and what those charges are. The, there's something of a question as to whether the uplifts that we're bringing through might lead to sort of more tripping points, more situations where those sites need to invest in grid reinforcement back through the system uh, to a greater degree. But that's a, a mixed bag and a mixed picture because those developments that are going ahead may well want electric vehicle charging points, may well want yep. other things that, that are adding to, to that general system load and, and situations in any case. Um, and one of the sort of particularly tricky aspects of this is if you have renewable generating technologies. So it's not just where you, um, if you have perhaps a heat pump or, or, or something which uses electricity, you may have a, a supply reinforcement issue. But the uplift that we have proposed is more likely to seek solutions, or we think that the more cost effective outcome to meet the new requirement is would be more likely to use an export generating. So you put photovoltaic uh, panels on the roof. That's been the kind of common assumption. And um, when you do that, that can actually cause problems and needing the reinforcement to be improved to support the export to the grid 
and that's a that's a more difficult and sometimes more expensive outcome but our current software and our current assessment and in discussions with NIE and um, in everything that we've done first of all we've tried to calibrate the proposals to minimize that so that it should be a, a more straightforward application process as far as NIE is concerned um, they, they should be small systems that we're asking to be put on, not the sort of 40% of your roof that, that England is asking or expecting to be put on, but we're looking at much smaller systems than that. Um, so, so, so that minimizes the, 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 the problem. And then the second kind of really significant thing that, we, that we've done is that our current software won't seek the export connection. So it will accept it's a it's a problem on our building regulation side i suppose or with our current methodology it will accept a small performance gap or a, a performance gap so that the energy that would have been exported but perhaps now isn't because the developer can't afford the export improvement or or because it's seen as unviable to provide the grid reinforcement cost for the export improvement we'll now accept we'll now accept that onto the system um, so long as there's been some small report or consideration made of that. I've answered that in a very kind of roundabout, a roundabout kind of way. I suppose if I was to summarize a bit better, I would say we've tried to calibrate the proposals to minimize the extent of grid reinforcement that might be needed, um, certainly in terms of exporting back onto the grid. And we've also accepted for now as a temporary kind of stopgap measure, uh, uh, a performance gap in in the actual in the emissions performance so people may put on an array uh, with a non-export connection and that non-export connection you would have a relay that would stop you exporting onto the grid but would allow the energy to be generated and used if it can be used in the dwelling or in the building straight away then that's fine um, and you would still get the full benefit of that for your emissions assessment whether it's export or non-export we try to encourage an export but we don't require it that's the sort of bottom line. And that, and that should help mitigate or reduce the extent of those costs. So basically, because the grid isn't, hasn't been upgraded and hasn't been invested on, we're having to take a suboptimal solution compared to what's happening in the rest of the nation, in a nutshell. Uh, you might wish to characterise it that way. Um, oh, I, I couldn't possibly I comment. If that, is that, a, is that a, 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 the, the normal uh, ter term of phrase? It's a, it's a DFE <laughs> yeah. issue. Uh, and for now, um, given our current software and given our current position, this is, the, this is a sort of sensible, pragmatic step that we can take. And we think that this will be useful in prompting and uh, more uh, focus in this area and in, in, in uh, sort of bringing this forward. Um, because we know that the next uplift really won't be able to work in that way. And I think that it's, it's fair to say that this, this uplift that we're putting forward here is helping to, to progress and highlight this. And uh, we've had you know, discussion with NIE and they're willing to try and, try, try and talk to us or, or work with us in, in taking forward next training steps and things that, that, that we've uh, spoken about. Uh, and we noticed that the, the energy strategy is committed to a review of the charging mechanisms. I don't, I don't know that it's a failure to invest in the, in the grid. I, from what I understand, which is, is not my uh, bailiwick or speciality, but from what I understand, it's almost more to do with the degree to which a new connection, the cost is applied solely to the developer or how much of that cost may be socialized out either to across developers or socialized out across to bill payers. You know, is it right that the grid reinforcement, you know, it might be right that the developer pays for the cabling up to his site, but is it right that the subsequent grid reinforcement that's needed because he needs more electricity or because he wants to export electricity back to the grid, is it right that that grid reinforcement back at the transformers or, 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 or a couple of steps back is also for the developer or should that be socialized onto bill payers? And I think it's that difference, which is perhaps the fundamental difference in the two, in the two, and or, or even three, because I think there's a, a, another degree of, of um, socialisation in the republic. So if you've got those three sort of systems, the republic, uh, GB, and ourselves, uh, it's trying to get that, trying to get that balance right. And I think, to be fair, the Northern Ireland system was always calibrated with the extent of not trying to add costs to consumers' bills. Whereas in England, that, that, that grid reinforcement cost would be socialised onto their bill. So 
how, how one sorts that out is really a matter for the Department for the Economy. Um, and um, I think they have made some sort of, they've noticed the problem, they've signaled on it in the energy strategy. Um, and we look forward to trying to work with them and, and to see or to, to emphasize that our future uplifts would uh, certainly, uh, if we want to provide particularly heat by electrification and, and widespread uptake of heat pumps, which looks quite likely, then, then you know, developments in that position affect how we, how we take things forward. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you very much indeed for your fulsome answer. Uh, you know, it's not often in this committee that I'd wish Paul Frew was back, but he could have gotten stuck in an NIE on that one for us as well. Okay, Malisha, over to you. Well, I've got chair. I'm just waiting for you to ask. Just thank you for your statement as well, too. Just a couple of points of uh, information, maybe you helped to uh, clarify for me. Just uh, that, given we'll say, even the figures that you've been working on currently, uh, are they likely to have been totally and absolutely superseded now, given uh, the recent and continuing rise that we have, not only in materials, but in particular uh, with gas, uh, which is likely to impact not only here in Ireland, but throughout the whole of Europe as well? Yes, is the short answer. So the, the impact assessments are a, are a are a curious uh, and uh, eccentric business. Um, and I think economists do not um, understand this. But the basis for our running costs, so I think in Appendix B of the impact assessment there, we've got some outcomes for typical dwellings. But those are based on our um, the UK average price for oil, for gas, for um, uh, electricity. And I uh, believe uh, that that average price in those situations comes from our own software modeling. So it would be the it would be the it would be the systems or the the the, the the system that's used for EPCs, basically, it would, it would be that, the latest version of that that's coming out from England that we have used. And its costs are based on, I think, an average of the previous three years valuations. So um, if, if we have got savings of £100 for gas uh, in, in our assessment, those savings or those benefits would now be, you know, if, if gas has gone up by 200%, you know, well, they're likely to be £200, aren't they? Because, you know... Um, so, so the benefits, I suppose, could be significantly greater. Um, but the question is whether those benefits are likely to stay and remain for the next sort of 50, 60 years that these buildings are built. It's, it's, quite, a, it's quite a difficult uh, assessment. But in that Appendix B, which gives outcomes for typical dwellings and the you know, immediate outcomes for, for next year's build or for next year's costs, yeah, they're now going to be outdated and there'll be even greater savings given the... Um, given the um, increase in, in, in gas and oil prices yeah, and, and electricity. Uh, I'm not even not sure that the UK average price is a good guideline for us here in the north of Ireland in particular, where we are always at the higher end of the scale when it comes to sort of energy sourcing and that. Uh, but in addition to just that for uh, I note that uh, comment was made on solar panels and so on, and I still and its infancy in many respects, uh, the development of uh, a battery system for solar panels uh, that would allow people not just to we'll say heat water, but to heat their homes and that as well. So uh, uh, on the first point about which set of prices you take, that's, that's certainly something we're keen to try and consult on in, in our fees too, about whether we should be moving to sort of Northern Ireland prices, Northern Ireland grid factors and Northern Ireland particulars. but. In, in so doing, you add another layer of, com of complexity uh, and assessment, and it becomes difficult to compare to other regions and things. But yes, it, I totally take the point on, on, on that. Um, I think when we last looked at it, Ronan, didn't we find, I think, that Northern Ireland's electricity, maybe, maybe in part because of those socialisation issues that we talked about, was maybe actually slightly lower than the UK? But I, I certainly take the point that yes. gas prices were higher and, and oil prices would be slightly lower, I think, too. Yeah, that's correct. Slightly higher gas prices here and slightly lower oil prices. Um, so in, in terms of. We're not, all, we're not always. And we were surprised that, that when, we looked, when we did at, at an early stage take a look at that. We were surprised that it wasn't as variable as we maybe thought. On the on the battery storage thing, that's another interesting element to things. Um, again, in communication with the technical subcommittee and that that we're looking at this, the general thoughts were batteries are a, are a great idea, 
they um, are, uh, however, they're still really quite expensive. It's quite an expensive kind of outcome there. Um, but they factor into this whole issue that I was talking about earlier about, um, you know, it might be, it might on some sites, for example, be beneficial to put a battery in rather than paying for that grid reinforcement all the way back uh, through the system if the reinforcement costs were high. And, and we certainly try to encourage that that gets looked at under the new guidance. The new guidance says go away and look at these other things and try and produce a little report. If you have a non-export connection and you're really going for that, try and do a, a report to sort of show how you've maybe explored how you, how you could put a battery on or, or, or what might be done. Now, we don't require anything. But, but because we give this alliance, but, but at least it, it keeps people alert to the options that are out there. Perhaps a more immediately useful one that is being taken up quite, quite a lot, because it's a much cheaper solution, is a hot water diverter. So if the electricity can't be used in your house to run your washing machine or your lights or your computer because you're working from home, it gets diverted to heat up the hot water and that helps run with your domestic hot water supply. And um, I know that we've worked with the building research establishment. We, we intervened actually in some of the proposals that England have coming forward because their next edition of the software looks at this, um, this in use factor, the how much electricity is used in the building and how much is exported. It looks to provide a much more accurate assessment of that in the next iteration. And that next iteration, um, we, we, uh, the way it treats hot water diverters and that, we, we, we investigated and that, so we're alert to that coming forward in the, in the, next, in the next sort of uh, phases as, as we progress. But, it's, uh, but I suppose the pace of change around all of this is kind of part of the issue about how this all kind of comes together. Uh, just one other issue, and I'm not clear on this uh, myself, just in uh, relation to uh, the use of heat pumps. Uh, that uh, whilst they're more environmentally friendly, it may be the case that um, the cost will still remain high. Why is that? Yeah, so, so that, that's a really significant point that I, I think is, isn't as well appreciated by uh, society and um, even, even in the sort of energy conservation sector and that. So heat pumps are, 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 pumps are, are marvellous things. A, because they use electricity, and that electricity is increasingly itself decarbonized. But B, they, they um, take, uh, they have a sort of efficiency of 300% or so. So for every one unit of electricity they, they consume, they produce three uh, units of heat. So that, that's great. Um, but if we compare, if the price of electricity is perhaps uh, 18 pence a kilowatt hour, whereas the price of gas is 4 pence a kilowatt hour, then, um, and their, if their efficiency is 300%, then the, the heat pump itself is still costing 6 pence a kilowatt hour to run, which is more than the gas, the gas boiler, which, uh, which is costing 4 pence a kilowatt hour to run. And then the heat pump itself is more expensive. Um, so so uh, its initial capital cost is more. And then, if you recall, because of our overall emissions target that we've set, um, we're requiring offsetting of the gas emissions. And so they've achieved that offsetting by providing uh, photovoltaics on the roof. So, so, so uh, you, that's why the figures in, in Annex B are, are showing that there's not the same saving or benefit from installing heat pumps as you want. And really, until fuel price pricing is correctly uh, recalibrated. I think I think we're in a process of a, a great kind of societal change where you know, the lower carbon fuels will have to be relatively lower priced relative to the higher carbon fuels. If you had a carbon fuel carbon tax or something on, on those fuels to make them more expensive, then obviously the heat pump and the lower carbon solutions co come through. But at the minute, it, the, the great challenge, and I think it's the challenge for all the regions, is is that the um, heat pumps, even though they only use a third of the energy. If electricity is more than three times the cost of of gas per unit, yeah. then it's still there, and then they're still more expensive to run. Yeah. And just finally, my last question: uh, that um, the department indicates uh, that it is to revise guidance in respect of Part F of the modern regulations. Uh, can the department explain maybe how, without new regulations, that will ensure compliance with the nearly zero energy building standards? 
Yeah, so the, so the current regulation is Regulation 43B, which requires that all new buildings um, should be built to the NZEB standard. And we provided interim guidance in the, in the face of that, that, that the building to the current standard would be acceptable. Um, so the new guidance that we have provided here is saying that um, if you're a building an NZ building, which is all new buildings, you now need to better that standard. So this will be the new, more robust standard to come in uh, uh, to provide for that. So the regulation is already there, um, and it's redefining what the department believes nearly. In effect, it's kind of redefining what the department's interpretation of nearly means. Uh, uh, this is now going to be the new standard for what nearly zero energy building means. In the same way that the, many of the regulations uh, require people to be to build to an adequate or a reasonable standard, um, this is now a new definition or a new expectation of what nearly zero energy building means, as opposed to the, the, the previous position. And I think that all the regions of the UK have this uh, have taken this approach, um, where they, they see that um, you know the NZ. NZEB hasn't really been interpreted with quite the same uh, definitive line line that maybe some other regions of of Europe have, or other um, uh, member states or, or member states in Europe have, um, as it originated from the directive. Other places in Europe have kind of taken a prescriptive fixed. This is what NZEB means, and that's it forevermore. Uh, whereas I think the approach, <coughs> pardon me, across the UK has been. Well, this is NZEB for now, and then it'll be this, and then it'll go to that, and then it'll it'll keep improving. So, um, that's that's the way it has that's the way it has gone. And and I suppose the delay in us getting there has been us waiting to get clarity around all of that from the UK government for some time. Um, but it's only it's only um, <coughs> it was only um, at the start of um, 2021 that that kind of came through to allow us to kind of make this um, make make our own independent efforts to progress. If that's any help. Okay, Cromagot. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. Just so, Marisha brought up a very good point there. So these changes in building regulations, because there are changes in building regulations, will come into force in on the 30th of June this year. That, that's our expectation or our plan. Um, I mean, well, that's what the draft. That's what we've put before you. We, we need ministerial approval to do that, and obviously that comes dependent on you know recommendations of the committee. But at the minute, with the approval that from the Northern Ireland Building Regulations Advisory Committee, that that's the direction we should go in, and we'd be making a recommendation along that line to to, to the minister with your own input, though. So that's going to so, and you're you're recommending the uh, we go for the forty percent option. Yes. And you have seen the response from the Construction uh, Employers Federation. Yes. <laughs> so they they are of a mind that that the increase in costs to go from option two to option three are, are quite substantial, um, but that doesn't don't, tally don't, don't, know, with, sorry, with, with our own assessment. Um, it, it, I think that. There may be an issue there where you know they've got costs from a particular site or something has arisen, uh, and they've been quoted you know very large grid reinforcement costs, or there's some unfortunate uh, position in, in that place or in that case. But um, I mean the, the proposals we've put forward are um, not in uh, are in line in the costings, and that that we have in, are in line with uh, some of the work that's been done on the impact assessments by other regions. And in effect, the, the you know the only difference should be an extra couple of photovoltaic panels, um, which should not be thousands of pounds, as the CEF seem to perhaps have suggested. But we do know so we, from, we do know from better experience that any time anybody tries to connect anything through NIE, it's thousands of pounds. You know that is, you know that is a that is regret an regrettable fact of life in Northern Ireland. Anybody who's trying to build a house in not even just in sort of rural areas and tries to get a connection from NIE and sort of looks at the price of it, um, that is you know it's extortionate uh, to many people. So I mean you know when they when they say that the difference in price between the sort of the 25% option and the 40% option, a lot of that's built on sort of grid connection issues. That's a real Significant concern. I know that's a lot of concern for my constituents, um, and uh, I've I've seen it from many other people. Those issues. 
Okay, sir, Keith, do you want to come in there? Yeah, I, I just want to be a bit of clarity, and Melissa touched on it <coughs> yourself. Just a John and Ronan for my clarity. Is this guidance, or is this you must? In reality, um, this is the guidance. The, the, in reality, this guidance is pretty well a must. It's pretty difficult to see how you would you would achieve an NZEB standard if you don't do the things that are outlined in the guidance. It's 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 as good as a requirement, I would say. I think okay. that's reasonable. That in theory, well you're in theory you're often able to find other ways around it. So in other matters, you might be able to provide another route or an, or, or show another another uh, position. Um, so if you were dealing, I don't know, perhaps with a means of escape, we may say you know you need in the guidance you might say you need two stairs and you need uh, you should have two stairs and uh, you know they should be 15 meters apart. And then uh, someone may come along and say, well, actually, I've got two stairs 20 metres apart, but I've got a sprinkler system in, and I feel that, that that's an alternative way to provide a, a, an adequate means of escape. And that case might be taken. It's very difficult to see how anyone would have take such an alternative approach uh, to, the, to the guidance uh, in, in relation to this, because we're really saying you need to better this emissions requirement by 40%. So I can't see how people would... Uh, get round that, to be honest. And so per, it's pretty much a requirement. As per Steve's point, you know, why forty percent? Why not thirty-five? Why not forty-five? Yeah, it was a balanced kind of overall um, judgment. The forty percent, I think, on a large detached house, um, one hundred and ninety square meter house, there brought us to something like three point three um, kilowatt hour peak. Uh, photovoltaic array and we know that at 3.68 kilowatt peak um, photovoltaic array Northern Ireland Electricity kind of switch the, the application process it becomes a more protracted and difficult and more um, unlikely to be successful application process where they where they would be more um, less well it's just a more it's a more complex uh, assessment I suppose um, and so 40% gives us a, a, a good factor of safety on that, on even you know, a very large detached house. Um, so that was, I suppose that's one, one sort of outcome that might so, um, give you a, a basis for it. And what, what's that figure today? You're one option three at 40. What's that figure today on a new house? What's 40% today? Cost? No, no. What's the 40%? Uh, you're, you're recommending 40%. What is it today? Zero? What's what's the current emissions? Yeah. That um, if you give me one minute, I could uh, we could look that up. It would be in the it'll be in the impact assessment document. You would have a look look at me. It'll be in table B. I think it's in table B three of appendix B of the impact assessment, Ronan. If you have that. Yes. <clears throat> That's page uh, 304 of your pack. No, that's what I wanted you to do. Hmm. Under what, why is the wee pack the, yeah, okay. okay. So it's right at the bottom. So it's uh, 2796 for current yeah. work coming 2426. So that's uh, 2,900 and, or two, 2,796 um, kilograms of carbon dioxide would be allowed to be emitted if you had a gas fueled house at the minute okay. um, and uh, if you had an oil fueled house you'd be allowed uh, 3889 kilograms of carbon dioxide to be emitted at the minute whereas that those figures then get reduced uh, proportionally there under option two and option three so they're saving 300 or so kilograms uh, under option three which is substantially less than the betterment, I should say. The, the reason for that is that the current software would show a 40% betterment. This is where we, we made it clear that because the, most of the saving that we're proposing here is from the photovoltaic array, um, and the figures that we've shown there are based on the current decarbonized average as opposed to the current software. So the current software would show uh, different values to those but those are the actual savings that would actually be made. So when we say a 40% betterment, it's it's a long way short of that, as you can see. It's perhaps closer to, from memory, I think it was closer to 
14, 12 to 14 percent. But the current software, which assumes there's far more carbon in electricity, would show a 40 percent benefit, if that makes sense, because the photovoltaics would be saving much more carbon under the, under the current methodology. It's interesting in your modeling that, of course, the sort of the annual running costs work out at sort of depreciation over uh, 10 years from the up cost and the investment and putting the sort of the PV on the roof. But the actual length of time, that must presuppose then for the PV is going to actually last longer than a decade. So you're going to have to have PV that is moving out towards nearly the 20 year mark. Yeah, that's right. I think we've allowed it. I think we've allowed a 20 year replacement for photovoltaics again in keeping with the other regions assumptions. OK, and that's the same for heat pumps, because I know the chances of getting a heat pump in our climate to last that length of time is not realistic. So that was that was reworked under the revised impact assessment that was changed from 20 years uh, to 15 again. Um, England had them at 20 again uh, in, in one version, as far as we knew, but they, they, they have 15. So, so we amended that to 15. Again, that was, that was a, a change made in light of some of the consultation responses. Right. OK. Keith, any more? So there are, we, t we, look at a, we look at a 10 year build period in the assessment and then how those buildings last for 60 years thereafter. So there would be four replacement cycles, I think, or three replacement cycles of the heat pumps and two replacement cycles of the photovoltaic arrays included, included in that in the longer term projections. Right. Uh, the tables B1, B2, B3 there are kind of immediate day one uh, uh, costs, if that makes sense, or costs and operating values. Okay. As opposed to longer term. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, Jer, I think personally I need to hear from industry on this, to be honest. There's, yeah, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of data there, a lot of information. And I just haven't got my head around to be honest. Yeah. Um, what's, what happens if the committee say we want... Um, what happens if we say we're not happy with this? And we'll want more information. Are you, are you asking me? Are you asking yeah, I'm asking you. Yeah. Um, if you want, if you want more time on this, we we are keen to try and and uh, publish. So the minister has a objective of publication before the end of this mandate. Um, so uh, we would have to advise the minister accordingly of the position. Yeah. Okay. Question. Sorry. Pat, Thanks, sir. I just noticed yourself, your own department, have stated that these changes will have a limited, if any, impact on fuel poverty. Yeah. So, I mean, the costs that you put on, and it's one percent. Uh, that's of the of the new build. That's all that we're talking about here at the moment. We're not. And the, the other question to you is. How do you monitor, monitor that over the 10 years? Like, I mean, if I go in for an energy certificate and sell my house, not know much about them anyhow, but you bring someone in and they, they survey your house and they give you a band, uh, A down to F, but you're saying here the, go the gold plate that you're trying to get by putting these measures all in place in a new build is an F rating which means that you can only sell that new build with an F rating. So I don't understand your question about the so, F rating. Right. So what you stated there earlier, that if these measures are all put in place on a new build, okay, am I correct with this? If, if they measure up to what you have asked them to do on a brand new build and it was your own words that it was listening to you stated that that it gets a rating of F, which means that it has met the criteria no. which is set out. That's wrong then. No, I don't know. I don't know where that has come from. Well, well how do you I'm, sell I'm that? House. There, sorry, How's we that? should be a SAP rating A or B. So if I've misled or if, if that has come okay, across, so, that, that would be so an error. What, what's the bonus of a builder to do all this work? Well, what's what's the bonus? Well, I mean, there, there are costs in it that, that are set out. I'm trying to figure out of you how do you measure this? How do you how do you survey this going forward in ten years uh, after this build are, are, are put in 
and the energy, the efficiency levels of the property, uh, as, as you stated, are met through that build, which has been dictated to, to the builder in order to try and put them in. And it's great if it works, but how do you measure it? I mean, all these things aren't going to, you know, they're, they're, they don't have a long lifespan on them. We're going to build every house east, east so, west, are we? Oh, that's what I'm trying to figure out. So, so the 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 modelling assumption in the cost impacts yes. is uh, based on uh, the energy modelling assessment software. So it's a it's you're quite right. It's an entirely theoretical. Where is the assessment. software? That's that's the question. Do you have the software? Yeah, it's, it's modelled in this. It's modelled in the same. So what, what, it's modelled in the same software as uh, used for EPCs. Right. And then we've re. It to the to fit the latest uh, the latest values uh, for that that are coming out in the new version of the software. So there's been there's been a bit of work done on that, but it's basically a, a theoretical model based on building the building physics model provided by EPCs, um, and it looks then at, at value and it values the carbon and, and benefits and things going going forward from uh, UK government data too get, gets looked at in in the assessment. But on, on the on the annex on the annex B values, they're uh, based directly on that energy modelling assessment software. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, sort of. Um, would it be worth just mentioning on, on fuel poverty? Um, the issue there is that um, the new build houses that are already being built today would be unlikely to be lead to a position where the homeowner or the, the bill payer was in, a, in fuel poverty, because fuel, the definition of fuel poverty is related to income and the fuel bill. So the fuel bills in new build homes are relatively low. So you would, you would think that the improvement, the marginal improvement on what's already, you know, arguably a reasonable, well, others would say it isn't, a, a reasonable new build standard going to a better standard isn't going to really tip or change dramatically the number of people who are in fuel poverty. Okay. Okay, team. Sir John Ronan, thanks very much indeed. We've just got to have a bit of a conversation here, but thanks very much indeed for uh, giving your evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, team. Are we all there? Um, sorry, I've, I've experienced Quincy before. He can go on forever. Sorry, what was that, Jim? You could go on forever. You're going on forever. <laughs> What's the news, Jim? <laughs> oh, I think I, I, no, I think it was just a sort of inadvertent. So. Okay, Tim, we've we've heard evidence from the department on these options. Um, yeah. Has anybody's got any sort of uh, particular perspectives on it? But from my view, I I don't get it. Oh, I, I want I want to. I want to talk to the industry and I want to talk to more people about that. And I think um, it seems to be driven by me. The number of times I've heard the words NIE and connection charges and costs and the rest of it being sort of brought into this, it just to me, it just feels I want to, I want to find out more about this. And I, and I appreciate the sort of the length of time and what the minister is trying to do and the rest of it. But I think we need to know a bit more about this. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Is there not a band for a new build house? In order to meet that criteria, you've got a certain accreditation. Yeah. Not that status. Yeah, I think it's A, then or not F. Right, so it's following the same as as your home. Yeah. For, uh, yet, yeah. there was no guarantee there that that they, uh, that that they have the software in place in order to manage all of that. I think there's, a, there's a lot there that I don't understand. There, a lot of that went on. It raised more questions than answers to me. I would say, um, Chair, if I may, that my comment I would make is that I'd like to comment. I think we have another another committee. I said on the, the economy committee, which is that when we change gear to talk about energy policy, it is necessarily more complex and technical than sometimes members are prepared for. And I don't mean that to insult any of us, but the truth is that because the core work of this committee is to scrutinise. Um, uh, public spending and fiscal stuff, we don't spend enough time, it, you know, when it comes to things like the building regulations, part of our brief, there is, if we're honest, a, um, 
sometimes a deficit in our ability to scrutinize things uh, in short order. So I think it, there is a, a case for um, uh, a bit more briefing, but obviously it has to be in the context of a very tightened mandate in the Clarkus. The thing that worries me is that you know, there is substantial cost implications here for new build housing, mm-hmm. but it's coming in in June this year. Yeah, uh, so just to the chair, I was going to ask that question. Yeah. Is that effectively the case? It is. That is what the, the briefing says, so June this yeah, year. June. But, uh, but only for planning after June. If you're building now, you know, it would be planning applications after June, my understanding. Yeah, but That's you could uh, think of any, everybody now who's saying, all right. That's my understanding now. That's what I took from The left cost, yeah. sir. So the left cost of business estimated two hundred and fourteen million over the first ten years, most of which seems to fall on domestic bills. Okay. Just an anecdote on that, you know, that uh, I've had that type of comment made by visitors from England and Wales that have arrived in Kesselderg and they can't get over the size of the houses. Our problem here is <laughs> our houses are too big, and we're probably all guilty of that. Speak <laughs> for yourself. Oh, uh, sorry, no, 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 can I no. uh, give my apologies? I'm going to have to go in for the budget debate that's about to start. Please up there. Oh, sorry, with yeah. me members for two seconds. Sorry. Apologies, I shall return. Like MacArthur. Yeah. I... Yeah, here, no. Okay, we're cool. Let's just start. Uh, we're, we're done. Can I just, while we're here, Chairman, just, that, some of us will have to, I presume, go out and make our own speeches yeah. in the budget bill debate, which is going to create, um, this was always going to create a challenge, I think, given yeah. we're having the budget my, bill my in the middle of the finance committee. I'll come back in again, and okay. then if we can keep as close to the court as we can. I have to go in, sir. Then, sir or whenever. Okay, I'll catch up. Yeah, okay, Tim, sorry about that. I think we all have to play this. Yeah, one, I'm going to go, and then you can come and I I'll follow you. So, then. members, are you content then to write to the department, seek an explanation about the impact on new houses? And the question the deputy chair just asked about <coughs> whether they're planning or whether they're being built. Um, also, the impact on the rating. So, I think what officials said was that it's Hold one, on. two, three, four, Matthew. five. Oh no, we're okay. We've got Melissa counts as two. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> you take that as, as you yeah, will. <laughs> Um, go home right. early this evening and I go out. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, so that what the officials indicated was that the SAP rating, so this is the standard assessment procedure rating of, which is the energy efficiency rating on the house, would be A or B anyway. And I don't know if this affects it very much, but any new house anyway would have to be A or B. So it, it would be, I think, sellable. I think that's what they're saying. Let's write to them and find out. Do you also want to seek a briefing from CEF? Construction Employers Federation. Yeah, yes, I do. There's a lot of information there and probably too much. And it's created more confusion in my head than it made it simplistic. And if we could get that both summarised. But I think the more you talk to all our industries, you'll get a better feel for it. But it's um, not in my opinion. I presume anybody else any other comments? Are you happy enough for that? No, great. 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 Yeah. Right. Jolly good. Thanks, members. OK, so we're moving on to changing places. Yeah. Yes, please. OK, the committee will now receive an oral briefing from the department officials on changing changes to changing places toilet guidance in respect of public buildings. I'm going to welcome on Starleaf um, Billy Black and Paul Daly. I'm correct? Hello. Can you hear me okay, yes. Billy and Paul, yeah? Yes. Hello. Okay. Dear Chair. Uh, I want to draw members' attention to the following papers relating to this agenda item. The clerk's brief at page 462, the departmental briefing page including the draft changes to the guidance at page 465. The previous related correspondence is from... Uh, is from page 539. Billy Paul, you're welcome to the Committee for Finance. We've invited you to the meeting to provide members with an oral briefing on changes to the changing places toilets guidance in respect of public buildings. Can I ask you to give opening remarks? Who's first, uh, Billy or Paul? It's uh, me, Chair Billy. Uh, go ahead there. OK, thank you, Chair. So the department proposes to introduce provisions t- for changing places toilets Um, abbreviated the CPTs uh, into building regulations by publishing amendments to technical book R, which is about access to and use of buildings, um, and by providing guidance to part R of the building regulations uh, 2012 as amended. Those are the principal regulations. These changes to technical book R will update and introduce provisions to include a CPT in certain buildings commonly visited by the public and of a certain size as defined by floor area or person capacity. 
The department developed consultation proposals with NIBRAC and its technical subcommittee for Part R on provisions for changing places toilets. Both England and Scotland have already made provisions for CPDs in their building regulations by amending their respective technical guidance rather than amending their regulations. The department's proposals were informed by and modelled based mainly on England's approach. The department ran a 12-week public consultation from the 20th of July 2021 to the 20th of October 2021 that included an information webinar town hall event for industry and members of the public. A summary of responses and the department's proposed response has been included in the information package provided to the committee. An overwhelming majority, 92% of the 97 responses uh, received uh, uh, agreed with the department's proposals. The pro proposals have not been altered following consultation and the Local Building Regulations Advisory Committee has been consulted and agreed the proposal at its meeting on the 4th of February. The department used a consultation to seek evidence to inform the development of proportional criteria and support the inclusion of a proposal for the installation of CPDs in certain buildings with planned alteration or extension works. However, as the consultation responses did not provide any evidence or data for these cases, the department now intends to take a two-phase approach. In the first phase, um, to be introduced in this mandate, the final proposals are the same as the consultation proposals in terms of the criteria where CPDs are provided in certain in-scope buildings, depending on their type, uh, their size, which is indicated by their footprint or the total, total people capacity. So for instance, in a, uh, a retail development, it might be meter squared and somewhere like a cinema or something like that, it might be the capacity, the number of seats uh, that um, are in the building. In-scope buildings in this phase are those newly erected are formed by a material change of use. In the second phase, we're going to undertake result, uh, research with the district councils to collect information on buildings, regulations, applications for planned extensions and alterations to consider criteria for the installation of changing place toilets within those planned works and to assess the likely cost impact the current ergonomic research being carried out by the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities uh, will also be considered in particular economic research into the use of a smaller three meter by three meter CPT as opposed to the one that's proposed for new build at the minute, which is four meters by three meters that could be more appropriate for these building situations. The first phase change to include CPTs within sanitary provision will impose additional costs of around 330,000 per annum. Um, there will also be a transitional one-off first year cost of around 84.4 thousand pounds for the construction industry, i.e. building control professionals, consultants, builders, etc. Uh, I'll hand back to you now, Chair, for questions, uh, comments or views. Okay, thanks, Paul. Paul, I have a couple of questions. Um, it's, I'm looking at in the pack here, and you've really, you're, you're saying here this the new guidance will increase this by 12 per annum. Yes. How how are you coming sure, sure. how are you coming up with that figure of 12? Just how did you get that? And obviously, the, and then second question under that, it's indicated cost of 25,000. I presume that's for a four by three, as you refer it. Yes, four by three for a new build. Um, so, with regard to those costs, and, and, and Paul may need to come in because he's yeah. the technical expert, we looked at planning applications over the past three years. So, we used criteria. Um, so, we had a suite of different types of buildings that are um, uh, regularly visited by the public. Um, the, and we looked at those buildings, the planning um, applications for those buildings. Um, and identified which were of a particular size and would trigger a requirement for a CPD under these proposals. And um, Paul can give you more details, but we came up with 12, um, 12 uh, CPDs per annum would be, would be triggered by these new requirements. Um, across the UK, there's about 1,500 CPTs. And in, in here in the province, there's about um, 50 of them, right? 
So um, we would expect that to increase um, by uh, 12 per annum. Those 50 that have been installed have been generally done voluntarily in the building regulations at the minute. We provide some uh, um, guidance which would say if you are interested in putting in a CPT, um, here's where you can go to get information on it. What we're now doing is moving from that position to say there is now a mandatory requirement in, um, on certain buildings of certain sizes that you put a CPT uh, in. And that's in addition to the uh, existing um, toilet or sanitary arrangements, which at this uh, stage include as a minimum a uh, wheelchair accessible toilet. So the 12, is, is that, have you based that 12, Paul, over a, a, an average of a few years, or did you just look back and sure, sure, if, Thank you, Chair. If I could come in, can, can you hear me okay? I'm just wondering. Go ahead, Billy. Can yeah. you hear me okay? Go ahead, Billy. Yeah. Can you, Sorry, Paul. Sure. Apology. Paul, yeah, that's okay. Chair, no, sorry, just to confirm that, yes, as Billy had, co had confirmed, yes, we had been looking at data that had been collected through the uh, ASRB4, which is the um, analysis statistical research um, branch, and that was over the past three years of major developments, which we feel these criteria could have the potential to deliver on once we actually propose these particular types of criteria for new build and for material change of use buildings. That, having looked at that data, it, pro it projected and modelled from that data, it projected potentially 420 buildings. That was the actual basis of the uh, information. And then we, when we applied filters uh, right down through, it drilled down to potentially 12 per annum. And that was based on the projections of uh, new build developments for major works developments that we feel the criteria would be targeted to. So these are large, these large buildings commonly used or potentially commonly used by the public where this CPD uh, guidance could potentially deliver uh, these provisions in future. Okay, and a couple more points and I'll bring all the members in. When, when does this, when do you anticipate this coming into, into uh, regulation? If you know it's agreed, uh, if it's agreed, sure. I think I'm going to you can conf confirm here from going over above you here, <laughs> sorry, uh, or under you as the case may be. Um, I think we're talking about trying to put publication in April, and then there may be a three month time before it actually ends looking at applications. Whether that may not be the case, Billy, you can confirm if that is the case yeah. or not. We're looking at publication anyway, potentially in the first of April. Uh, and, and then new plans thereafter will then be looking at for these particular in scope uh, relevant buildings, potentially then uh, the building control enforcement to consider uh, these appli their applications thereafter. Okay, so if, if everything goes yeah. according, sorry, go yeah. ahead. Billy. Sorry, Chair, can I just come in? Yes. Yeah, so, so what we would we would generally propose to do is um, we would be prepared to publish and that could be uh, as early as March and then there would be generally a three month lead in time and what we would try to do obviously you'd heard evidence uh, about party F there and they had proposed June so you know whether or not they are now going to go ahead and do that as the, they're waiting for advice from the committee but you know we would try to align dates so it would probably be a three month leading and in any case these are changes to technical regulations and because of the Northern Ireland protocol, we are required to notify Europe and there's a three month minimum, three month, 12 week standstill period. So, you know, once we hear from yourselves and if you have no issues, we would then be prepared to um, notify Europe and then we would have to wait a minimum of 12 weeks. We do not anticipate there would be any problems because the European regulations are effectively to prevent barriers to trade, but this proposal is, is, is in no way going to prevent a barrier to trade. And England and Scotland have already did similar things and Europe have, have accepted that. Um, so, you know, the earliest it would be brought in would probably be June, this June. Okay, Jim. Can you just uh, run that past me again? Are you saying, did you say that Scotland had to do this as well, or is this purely unique to Northern Ireland that we have to inform Europe? No, um, 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 Scotland did it um, uh, before EU exit. Um, so what actually happens is um, under the protocol, we still have to inform Europe in accordance with the EU directive. 
uh, England, Wales and uh, Scotland don't get away uh, scot-free because the basis of the whole information is that the World, Tra World Trade Organization has to be informed. So England, etc., in Scotland, although they, they've gone through EU uh, exit, they have to inform the World Trade Organization. In Northern Ireland, because of the protocol, we inform Europe, and Europe then informs the World Trade Organization and also puts the proposals out to all the member states. And then there's a 12-week standstill for member states to come back with any issues. Well, two questions. Why do we have to do this? And does Europe have the power to step in and prevent you making these changes? Uh, Europe can come back with um, issues. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on the protocol. It's a matter for the Northern Ireland Protocol. It's not a primary matter for building regulations. We're just making sure we comply with what we believe are the requirements of the protocol. We have spoken to um, the uh, people in England, the department that deals with this, which is BEZ, and they have said, yes, we, we have to continue notifying Europe under the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. But have, could Europe come back and say these don't comply with the 27 members of the EU, so you can't introduce them? They could, they could come back with issues, but we don't think they will. But I mean, who has the ultimate say here? Well, we, I mean, you, you suppose at the end of the day you can uh, publish and be damned, um, but um, uh, you know um, you could leave yourself open possibly to uh, infraction proceedings. Very interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. But as I say, Jim, uh, this is uh, um, the, the whole purpose of those regulations are to stop situations where, for instance, we would specify some sort of product or widget within our, our guidance that could only be supplied by local suppliers. So that meant the rest of the EU um, and the home nations couldn't, couldn't supply that product. So, so there be... is no, there's no situation in our proposals at the minute. We're simply asking, we're putting in um, to improve access to buildings. We're putting in, proposing to put in changing places um, we, you know, it requires a toilet, it requires a wash hand basin, it requires a bench. We're not specifying what those products are. Um, so people are free to put in wh whatever specification is appropriate and fit for purpose. So it would be absolutely terrible if a situation arose where a Northern Ireland company was the only firm that could provide these products and could take on extra staff and increase its viability. You're saying that couldn't happen. Well, it, it's 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 against it's against the, the 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 rules as they stand and the rules of the protocol. Presumably, that um, you do this. Right. That's even more interesting. I, did, I, I you know I wasn't party to the protocol. No. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm only following um, the procedures that we have to follow. Look, if you know if we didn't, I mean, I I, I would be very astonished if they came back with anything. Um, uh, you recall we did the ban on combustible materials, which was actually banning certain materials. I mean, they never came back with any issues on that. And if any of the proposals that we have come forward with, you would have thought that was the one they had the issue with. Thank you. Thank OK, you. and one final question from me, and then if any other members want in. Uh, if this goes ahead, let's say April, May, June, whatever, for the four by four in the new bills, the 12 new bills, as I would classify them, Mm -hmm. Is there any thought from the department with respect to retrofitting old bills? So old uh, shopping centres. Uh, sure, if I yeah. could answer that. Sir, <coughs> yeah. If I could answer that, please. Um, with regard to the, we, as part of this phase, we actually had asked a question in the consultation to try and glean information with regard to trying to get criteria established or considered or developed for specifically for existing buildings, particularly to do with alterations and extensions. Now again, remember, Chair, if you can do that, building regulations only apply to new works mm. and to when you're doing works, uh, when you're effective doing works, they don't retrospectively apply to existing buildings. Yeah. Therefore, existing buildings that have no intention of carrying out work won't actually have to be to consider any of the actual requirements here that are for the provision of CPDs, even if they are that particular type of building in the category that we, we, we propose to put forward. Again, it's about retrospective application. 
Now, we, when we were works or were proposed to do to existing buildings, and those existing building works could have been maybe extensions or alterations, we had tried to get modelling for that to allow us to do analytical analysis and evidence and check out the impacts and provide an impact assessment. Unfortunately, we did not have a statistical analysis database available to us at that stage to do that. We did have for new build and we did for and we did for uh, new buildings formed by material change of use, and that was delivered through the uh, abundant information held by the ASRB planning portal and planning database. Unfortunately, existing building extensions and existing building um, alterations don't actually form part of the captured data that ASRB have available to us. We did try other variable sources to try and to try and find alternatives to this actual missing data to allow us to consider criteria. Unfortunately, we kept pulled it blank. If you if you actually would then read our, our and if you have a chance to get through anyway, I don't know if I'll be able to generally understand that. But we did actually try to go to a Tascomi system, which is the actual building control system they have for their completions. But unfortunately, the actual filtering that we needed to be able to pop out specific buildings to identify the number of affected model buildings with regard to extensions and alterations couldn't be delivered through that system with the amount of information that was currently being put in. It would need a revisit, and we have been talking with building control at very initial stages to try and, in our next phase, or in our phase two proposals, try and glean that information out of their system to allow us to consider to move forward. Unfortunately, in the window of opportunity we had, we then decided with the agreement of NIBRAC uh, and the technical subcommittee, that because we were missing on this critical information to try and allow for analytical analysis development of uh, criteria for these particular ex existing buildings under alteration extension, and we didn't have that available to us, we agreed that it, might be, it would be prudent to put a question in the consultation out to industry, see if industry could come back to us with some degree of detail or data set or evidence or something that we could maybe look at with regard to setting criteria for those particular types of buildings. Unfortunately, that information did not arrive and didn't come back. Hence, why we are now proposing to, to move forward with, with, with your consideration, obviously, in a phase one and a phase two. Phase two then hopefully allowing us to then glean from building control and their data set, hopefully, when we uh, are able to drill down more with that and try and get inputs changed to allow that data to be lifted accordingly and allow it to be analysis. Hopefully that will then move us forward in the next phase to look at those particular buildings you have, you have rightly considered there could be potential for. Okay, but on one <coughs> final question, Paul and Billy, from me. So ultimately, if this goes through, any um, builder or developer or somebody building a retail premises above 2,500 metres squared, then through building control, will have to put one of these in place. Yes, that's that. That is the intention of the actual guidance that we have set. Uh, the guidance in that provision will actually set up that uh, building control when they see the application. If that particular application identifies, as you say, a retail property in excess of 2,500 square metres, whether it's public toilet ava available as part of that provision, there should be as part of that inclusive accommodation suite that they're going to be providing anyway. There should be in part of as part of that suite. It really says there'll be. An accessible toilet for independent wheelchair use. There'll be an ambulant uh, uh, toilets, and there'll be normal uh, normal application toilets for the facilities as well. And along with that suite, what the intention is to also include a change in places toilet to allow for dependent assisted uh, visitors and pu uh, public visitors to that particular retail provider. Okay, thank you, um, Paul and Billy. Any other members? Any questions? Happy enough. Nobody has indicated. Thank you very much, and I apologise for getting the names mixed up, but I'm sure you worked that out anyway. <laughs> All right. No problem. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. That's okay. Thank yeah. you, Chair. <laughs> um, thank you, Chair. Thank you. So, Chair, is the committee content with the guidance? Yep. Happy enough with it? So, members, are you happy enough with the guidance? <clears throat> content? Content. Yep. Okay, so we'll re respond to the department in those terms then? Yep. Okay. Agreed. Happy enough, members? Yep. Agreed, yep. Agreed. Lovely. Thanks. Okay. Good stuff. <clears throat> okay, we're now moving on to SL1, the pensions increase. The department proposes to make a statutory rule under the Social Security Pensions Northern Ireland Order 1975. The proposed rule would increase public service pensions by 3.1% in line with the consumer price index change between September 2020 and September 2021. Last year, the increase was 0.5%. 
HM Treasury makes a similar order to provide for equivalent pension schemes in GB. The Department advises that the proposed rule is not subject to any further Assembly procedure. The rule will take effect from the 11th of April 2022. The Committee is asked to note the SL1. The relevant papers are at page uh, 548. Members, have you any comments? Well, well, just to say, um, Mr Chairman, that whilst that was the relevant figure taken from the September CPI, the reality is, of course, that since then inflation has become rampant. So this, like the state pension increase, will no way put people on an equal footing as to where they should have been had uh, pensions increased with prices. But unfortunately, those who, have, who are about to receive these increases will probably get about half of the increase they actually need. That's just an observation. Uh, it's not as generous as it seems. Okay. Any other members? Any comments to make? No? Okay. If content... Uh, is the committee content to note SL1, the pensions increase, review order, Northern Ireland 2022? Is this agreed? Agreed. Okay. Yeah. And we'll pause there at this juncture, if we don't mind. There's the chair back. back. There's Keith Archibald's on her feet. So. Done? No, uh, we're now at number 11. Okay, number 11. Okay, team, as we seamlessly move on. Uh, uh, item number 11 on the agenda, SL1, the Public Service Pensions Revaluation <laughs> Order. The Department for Finance proposes to make the Public Service Pensions Revaluation Order in Northern Ireland 2022 under powers conferred by Section 9, uh, subparagraph 2 and 3 of the Public Service Pensions Act, Northern Ireland 2014. The proposed rule will increase the career average revalued earnings public service pension schemes from April 2022 by 3.1% in line with the Consumer Price Index, plus an additional revaluation percentage determined by the individual pension schemes. HM Treasury makes a similar order to provide for equivalent pension schemes in the rest of our nation. The order will come into operation on 1 April 2022 and is subject to negative resolution. Jim, you want to say anything? Nothing we can do. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Therefore, if members are content, is the committee content with the policy intention of the proposed rule, and it is therefore content for the department to make the rule? Is this agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Next item on the agenda, number 12, Statute SL1, the Rate Relief Loan Pensioner Alliance Regulations. These regulations add personal independent payments PIP to the Rate Relief Loan Pension Alliance Regulations Northern Ireland 2008 in order to ensure that PIP claimants who receive an equivalent award to Disability Living Alliance Higher Rate Care Component will be treated the same for the purposes of Loan Pensioner Alliance. The 2008 regulations allow for a carer or another person for whom the pensioner is caring to be treated as not living with the pensioner thus enabling them to access loan pensioner rates relief. The proposed rule is subject to negative resolution, assembly procedure and when comments effect on 1 April 2022. Any comments? Okay. Therefore, the members are content. Is the committee content with the policy intention of the proposed rule and is therefore content with the department to make this rule? Is this agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Next item on the agenda, Statute Rule 2022-50, the Regional Rates Order. The Department has made a statute of rule 2022-50, the rate, regional rates order in Northern Ireland 2022, under uh, Article 7, subpara 1 and subpara 3 of the Rates Northern Ireland Order 1977. The purpose of the rule is to set the amount of the domestic and non-domestic regional rates for the year ending 31st of March 2023. The regional rate to be levied on the rateable net annual values of rediments is to be 27.9 pence in the pound. The regional rate to be levelled on the rateable capital values of rediments is to be 0 0.04574 pence in the pound. This rep represents a regional rates freeze for 22-23, which it was understood was agreed by the executive before the First Minister resigned. 
Have we had any confirmation that that had been agreed by the executive? Because it's with us, um, I think the minister actually has said it in uh, plenary a couple of times, and because this is with us as well, uh, that's we may take it that it has been agreed. Okay. We can, uh, therefore, if we're content in that, this rule is subject to affirmative resolution procedure and will come into operation the day after as affirmed by the Assembly. Okay. Members are content. Therefore, the Committee has considered Statute Rule 2022-50, the rates, Regional Rates Order Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rule, recommends that it be affirmed by the Assembly. Is this agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, next item, uh, Statutory Rule 2251, Small Business Hereditament Relief. The Department has made Statutory Rule 2021-51, the Rates Northern Ireland, Small Business Hereditament Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022, under Article 31C of the Rates Northern Ireland Order 1977. The proposed rule will continue the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme until 31 March 2023. The scheme provides relief of between 50, to 20, of between 50 and 20% for businesses, depending on the rateable values, where the NIV is less than 15,000, to a total cost of 20 million in 22-23, the order will come into effect on the 15th of March 2022. The rule is subject to negative resolution procedure. Members, any comments? Are we content? Therefore, yes. Therefore, the committee has considered statutory rule 2022-51. The Rates Small Business Hereditament Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022 and subject to the report of the Examiner of Statutory Rules has no objection to the rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, Statutory Rule Registration of Deaths and Stillbirths. The Department has brought forward a draft statutory rule entitled the Coronavirus Act 2020 Registration of Deaths and Stillbirths Extension Order in Northern Ireland 2022. The statutory rule is led in draft by the Department as subject to draft affirmative resolution procedure. The rule extends those provisions which allows for registration of deaths by telephone and the provision of documentation electronically. The rule will also continue to waive the requirement for a medical practitioner to notify the coroner where the death is by natural causes and the doctor has not seen the deceased within the previous 28 days. The rule will extend these provisions until the 24th of September. 22? Yep. Okay. And obviously, if the executive doesn't come back, that rule falls on the. That is my understanding, Chair. Okay. Uh, Ministers Long and uh, Robin Swan uh, previously expressed some concerns in respect of the continued waiving of the 28 day rule in respect of medical practitioners advising the coroner. The committee wrote to Minister Long and Minister Swan seeking further feedback on their concerns. A response from Minister Long is at page 583. A response from uh, uh, Robin has been tabled. They indicate that despite their concerns, they are just about content for the rule to extend the provisions until September 22, but would be concerned about any further extensions. Is Cathy available? She is just on the line. Cathy. Hi, Steve Aiken here. How are you? Can't hear you. Have you, have you muted yourself, Cathy, by any chance? No, it's not us. Okay. Hi, Cathy. She not got us? Yep. I just would quite like the answer to that. She would be able to give it, wouldn't she? On. Um, what happened? Uh, Hold on. Bear agree. with us, members, why yep. email her. Sorry about this. May have a gap. Can't be. Sorry, members, we're having a wee bit of a technical problem here. We have an official on the line. She can't hear us, I think. We do a test run in advance, and it was fine. Yeah. Uh, no one was fine earlier. Not there. No, it's just getting a automatic response. Members, has any other members any views on this? 
I mean, my, my, cons my con I just want to know what will happen if the executive doesn't come back and does it fall, or does it stay in continuation, which is obviously what the concerns of both a sort of. Jim, Jim. Yeah, I must say I was a bit concerned with um, both the health minister and the justice minister's letters because they do convey um, concerns about whether or not this would facilitate practices and processes that normally shouldn't happen. And um, um, I'm just a bit uneasy with it, I must say. Yeah. And I mean, sort of, if you read particularly um, Robin Swan's letter, yeah. and I, I think, and it's not, I'm not putting words into the minister's mouth, I think if he'd thought that this was going to be continuing any way beyond September, I don't think he would have been, he would have been content at all. And I think yeah. I would quite like to have a, an answer from uh, Cathy Walker about what are the provisions if, uh, for extension of this further, because I don't think, bearing in mind what both the Justice Minister and the Health Minister have said, that uh, we as a committee, uh, I'm not putting words in anybody's mouth, obviously, but uh, we as a, w our, our committee would probably take, have to take a view on whether it should be extended beyond that. So yeah, I agree with that. Hopefully, try Cathy now. Cathy, can you hear us? Yes. Can you ah, hear me? Sort of. Well, welcome. Welcome to the committee. <laughs> okay. I've, I've lost you. Hang on one second. <laughs> okay. Got you now. Sorry. Can you hear us okay? Yes. Can you see me? My camera doesn't what? seem to be on. No, that, that, that's fine. Just provide we can hear you. So first of all, okay. welcome, welcome to the committee. The question we have, particularly about the statutory room, is if obviously if the executive doesn't come back, what will happen? Will it stay in perpetuity, or does it end in uh, does it end in September 22, and therefore we go back to the original system? What what what's your what, what what's the answer to that? It can only be extended for six months, so it can only go up to September 22. It can't go past that. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at. Um, bringing forward something around the registration of deaths and stillbirths um, on, on another medium, on another piece of legislation. Okay. But everything drops then, including the electronic bit. So, uh, but that means that for nothing happens then on the 20 in, in September. That's everything that includes the electronic piece oh. as well. Yes. Uh, sorry, I've got my got my camera Yay. sorted out. Yay! <laughs> nice to see you. Um, yes, everything um, would finish on uh, the 24th of September. So that would be the electronic transfer of documents and um, the signing of the medical cause certificate of death and the uh, 28 days for the coroners. OK, 28 days. Members, have any comments? Jim? I've seen the correspondence from the Justice Minister and the Health Minister on this issue. Can you, can you, I'm going to repeat his question. Uh, Jim, could you repeat that question? We're having some comms yes. issues here. Cathy, did you hear that? I was asking Cathy uh, if no. she had seen the correspondence from the Health Minister and the Justice Minister. No, um, but I'm assuming it is similar to um, when they wrote to us earlier on um, in the year. Um, they, uh, I'd asked them before um, whether they had any concerns, or Minister had asked before if they had any concerns. I've obviously been talking to officials for the last two years just about any concerns and uh, putting in place anything we can to mitigate any um, situations. So, but I haven't seen officially the, the responses back. And did, were, were concerns expressed to you through officials? Well, we just talked in general about no things that, um, what it exactly it meant, but I, um, Department of Health issued guidance to medical practitioners on um, who can sign the um, MCCD. Um, and obviously the coroners were aware of the 28 days. Um, and we had planned for this before um, COVID had hit when we were doing our um, pandemic planning. Okay. But, sort of, but there is a concern about the fact that um, certificates can be signed by a doctor who hadn't seen the patient in the 28 days. Yes, the, w the way the legislation is written is that um, Dr. A is the doctor who would have seen you in the la treated and seen you in the last 28 days. Yeah. Um, if that doctor wasn't available, then Dr. B could sign. So that doctor would be somebody, say, who was in the um, same surgery or um, in the same ward in the hospital 
And then Dr. C is the last resort. So Dr. C is someone who would say, yes, this person was being treated, I didn't see them, but this is what, what they died of. I mean, a doctor is signing to the best of knowledge and their belief um, as to it. But I mean, these are for um, natural um, diseases. Anything that's not natural still is reported to the coroner. That didn't change, regardless of the 28 day so, rule. So can you help us, uh, how many, or what percentage of certificate signatures would have been by what you'd call the Dr. C, who'd never seen them or anything else? Okay. I wouldn't have that information because it's not something that GRO would be aware of. Um, it would probably be something that the Department of Health would know, but um, we wouldn't know that. We would just see um, the signature, the cause of death and the signature, etc. But I wouldn't know if it was a doctor A, B or C. Hmm. Thank um, you. Jim, sort of members of the committee, obviously um, Cathy hasn't seen the correspondence from the, either the Health Minister or the Minister for Justice. I think I would quite like her to see that correspondence and maybe we might consider this next week. Having sure, but we have ascertained that it only sits until September. So it's only a regulation until September. Yeah, but I think Mike, I think I, again the concern raised by Jim and sort of one of the concerns that I have about this is the situation has already moved on. Yeah. And uh, even though it is waiting until September, uh, I'm surprised that the um, I, w I, w I would feel happier if they, uh, if Cathy had actually seen the concerns raised by the sort of the health minister and the justice minister. I think they have seen, uh, not to put the words in the official's mouth, but I think she has seen because this was in the information that we have in front of us uh, what their concerns were. It was about the 28 days, mm -hmm. um, but also. Department of Finance wouldn't be able to comment on that. I think it's really, if the uh, health health committee would have, or the, sorry, Department, Department of health, health would have the information on the certificate signed by Dr. C to the extent to which this is actually used. This is also subject to draft affirmative resolution, so there will be a yeah. debate. So it's up to members. You know, we could certainly bounce it into next week. I'm just conscious of the time running out. Yeah. Um, uh, but what you could also do is write to the Minister of Health and seek uh, clarity on the questions Mr Alistair has raised and we would copy in the Minister of Finance who hopefully would provide this during the debate. Okay. I think the reason why I'm sort of I've issued about that is, is I've, I know the members have all read both the letters from the Minister for Justice and the Minister for Health and it is on the terms that there are real concerns but in this exceptional circumstances but I think it's important that you know we we bottom those concerns out um, before we sort of uh, do that. And I appreciate sort of adding it into next week is uh, right. probably an issue. So we want health and justice yep. officials to come along and speak to what these issues are and uh, allay the committee's concerns. Yep. If, is, would the committee be content with that? Yep. Right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. These are exceptional circumstances. Yeah, but we're. I, I understand, and I've heard, and I've read the letter as well. But I think that, I mean, I would be, I'm fairly comfortable in order to go with the information that we have. I think bringing it back uh, to make the same decision. Most of us are minded, I believe, to agree with this, and you're going to bring it back, and I know that it will be the same decision. Yeah. Sorry, Alicia. <laughs> well, just to the chair, I agree with uh, Pat uh, on that. Uh, and I don't think that uh, any other information we're going to be given next week will change our mind. Uh, and given that it is for that six-month period, then I think we should hold it now and move on. <clears throat> Hello. Um, I'm. Uh, easy. I mean, uh, in terms of, of delaying it to next week, what's the, what's the likely impact of that mm -hmm. going to have on its progress? I don't think there's any impact on delaying its progress. Is there? I'm not sure. Um, just to get it actually onto the order paper before the end of the mandate, which well, it's, is not, it's, not, it's not going to be in the order paper. It's not in the order paper for next week anyway. Yeah, but it would be if well, the committee were to consider March. it next week, then it wouldn't be considered by the business committee until the following week, which means you are sort of up against it. You, I, I would imagine they will uh, accommodate the committee, but um, we are sort of running out of time. Just if we're, we're clear on what we want from what the committee wants from officials, 
Um, just give me a second. I'll just sort of get a review from the two gyms. Jim? I have no strong views out of the way. Okay. Other Jim? Uh, well, I do have concerns, but if the consensus is that we don't need to bother about it, then I'll probably go along with that. Um, so, taking the mood of the room uh, and sort of over the ether, I think uh, I've listened, and I think your view is that we would proceed with the uh, statutory rule, uh, bearing in mind the sort of the discussions that we, we have had. Would that be a fair assumption? Okay. But also, Chair, to write to the Department of Health, yep. seek clarity yep. on um, the questions that Mr. Alistair has asked about the number of certificates and the detail of what their concerns were. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I, I just, I just I, again, and I, I, I don't want to labour this too far, team, but you know we've had both the Justice Minister and the Health Minister have indicated concerns, which just fills me with a degree <coughs> of nervousness. But uh, I've, I've listened to the committee of where we are. So, therefore, uh, bearing that in mind, that is the case. Um, sort of. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Ka Cathy. She's going to stay with us for the next one. Oh, you're going to stay with us for the next one. Okay. Therefore, the committee has considered the Coronavirus Act 2020 Registration of Deaths and Stillbirths Extension Order, Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the report of the examiner's statutory rule, recommends that it be affirmed by this assembly. Is this agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay, next item, Statute Rule 2248, the Marriage, Civil Partnerships and Civil Registration reg Regulations. The Department for Finance has made a statutory rule under powers conferred by the Births and Deaths Registration Northern Ireland 1976, the Marriage Northern Ireland Order 2003 and the Civil Partnership Act 2004. The statutory rule will be subject to negative resolution procedure and will come into force on the 11th of March 2022. The statutory rule will introduce changes to civil registration legislation to enable registrations and subsequent life event certificates to be produced with the choice of certificate headings in English, Irish or bilingual English-Irish, with all content remaining in English. The option would apply from 11th of March 22 and for all new certificates and not, will not be applicable to previous certificates. Yeah. Members, do we have any questions we would like to ask Cathy? Why? Uh, Jim Allister first, and then okay. Jim Wells. Jim, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to know, Cathy, what demand was there, or what what provoked this change? Okay, um, this is um, a new decade, new decade, new approach commitment, five point one three. So that is why um, we're putting it in place. But was there any public demand for the change? There has been um, public demand, yes. We've had uh, questions, actually we get questions quite a lot in the office. Um, I'm could you quantify that headed... for me? Well, we would get questions, um, people phoning in to GRO asking us um, what is available in Irish, um, what the certificates are, um, when the, uh, we obviously advise that they aren't available in Irish, you know, when will they be available in Irish? And we would probably get um, one or two of these a month um, questions. They're the ones that would get through to us because obviously when you ring us, you get um, through to NI Direct first because they're our call centre. But the ones that actually get through to us, um, we would be um, asked that quite regular basis. But like I say, we're actually um, fulfilling the commitment on the um, NDNA. Well, um, 5 .13. Saying, it's, saying it's NDNA doesn't impress me. But what you're telling me is that maybe 20 people in a year have asked this question. Well, that the would be the number of people. That. Apologies. Um, that would be the number of people that would get through to GRO, but I don't know how many would actually ask um, NI Direct or actually ask registrars when they're going to do a registration. Well, that's wholly speculative. Like, if you ring NI Direct, you're asked who you want to speak to, you hold on, and eventually you get through. We have that experience for all sorts of agencies, so you can't speculate that there would have been more people if they got through. What do you know? No, I'm just saying that I don't been, know. There might have been one to two people a month, which might be as few as 12 a year, uh, who have asked about this. And I'm full of that. We're making a legislative change. No, sorry. What I said was I don't know how many people have asked NI Direct. I only know how many people have gone through to us yeah. in GRO. Which might be a dozen people in a year. I don't know. 
One, one to two a month, if the bottom end would be a dozen, wouldn't it? So why is this negative resolution? Um, it's because of the um, legislation that it's connected with. Um, the 1976 order gives us the power to make um, regulations and under negative resolution. Yes. But the primary driver in this was NDNA then? Yes. And that seems to have been the only appetite for it? Um, well, that's what I'm putting it in under, yes. The requirement came, the commitment was to um, have registrations in Irish. So that's, that's what we're fulfilling, mm -hmm. that commitment. And uh, none in Ulster Scots, I know? No, that wasn't a commitment. Thank you. Okay. Other Jim? Um, what if many of these 70,000 Polish speakers that we have in Northern Ireland requested the documents in Polish? What would the reaction be? Um, well, the answer would be at the moment that the um, certificates are only available in English. Um, and then after the 11th of March, the answer would be that the certificates with headings are available in English, Irish or dual. They're not available in Polish. Right. And how much is this going to cost? Um, so far, it has cost um, 261,000. That's for the IT what? changes. Sorry. Right. Did you say 1,000? Sorry. Did you say 1,000 or 216? 261,000. 261, Two hundred sixty-one thousand pounds, so that twelve to twenty people a year can have their certificates in Irish. I mean, I, am, I, am I hearing things here? No, that's that's the cost of the change to the IT system. Yeah. So the salaries of eight nurses during the year. That's right, gentlemen. Jump through the chair. Through the chair. Some of us may be right. here yeah. as well. That's right. Uh, just, just for just for clarification, because uh, regardless of what, uh, that is actually quite a surprising figure. So, 261,000, one, slightly over a quarter of a million pounds, was the changes needed for the IT system to change headings and language in certificates? Is that correct? Yeah, um, it's, it's more than just changing some head, headings. It's all links to different parts of the database, etc., to make sure that whenever a registration is done correctly, that um, if it is going to be in Irish or if it is going to be in dual or if it is going to be in English, that everything is in that same language. So um, there's a lot of um, checks and balances to be done. But yes, it was 261,000 to change the IT system. That, that's, that's absolutely staggering. I thought you said two hundred and sixty one pounds. I didn't realise you were going to say two hundred and sixty one thousand. So that maybe twenty or thirty people can have their certificate in a language other than English, even though of course every one of them are fluent in English. Have you spent this money before you brought this legislation to this committee? Yes. 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 So in other words, it's a done deal because the money's been spent and yet now you're consulting this committee about something you've done already because the money, that, that fast amount of money, what is what the salaries of about eight nurses has been wasted. So that if, to, to pander to a tiny number of people who, who can understand their certificate in English already. I think, I think uh, Mr. Wells, you've made your point and that's on the record. Um, but uh, just, just, for, just, 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 wait, just wait one second, Jim. Oh, sorry, Jim Allister. So for absolute clarity, Okay, the money that has been spent on these software changes already is two hundred and sixty-one thousand pounds. Yeah, the total. Yes, the total is two hundred and sixty-one thousand. Yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Chair, I wanted to ask. Uh, just, 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 sorry, just. I interrupted. Uh, sorry, just wait. Sorry, uh, Malisha, then Pat. Okay. Sorry, I think Pat was oh, before me. Go ahead. Well, it's just to, uh, to, to welcome that it's an equality issue and uh, I, I see that that could be if someone wants a certificate in their native tongue, they're quite entitled to have that and I believe that's where we are and where we're moving uh, to go. So I would welcome what's been done here today. Okay. Alicia? Proposed. And just I'd like to endorse just what Pat has actually said there, that I welcome it as well too. It is the indigenous language uh, of this country. 
and that uh, for those that are so much uh, an objection to it, they might find that if they check out, even in terms of their own DNA, that their forefathers were Gaelic speakers as well, many of them that came from Scotland what, what to the north of Ireland. The and what I do say is that uh, as is recognition of an equality issue uh, for all of the Gaelic speakers who continue to live here in this country, and that uh, uh, for those who wish to uh, register an Irish, it is a welcome um, uh, facility for them in every respect. Uh, and you know, it's not that way long ago that when uh, the anti-Gaelic or Irish uh, dimension existed. Uh, here uh, in the north of Ireland and throughout the whole of the island of Ireland, that Irish natives whose names were in Gaelic were prevented from registering their own names other than in a foreign language to them at that time, which was English. So to say it is a welcome uh, facility now for those born and raised here on the island of Ireland, speaking the indigenous language of this country, that they have that facility to register as Gaelga. Because White Lobsa, just a ra, Foster, Tashi, and Tark, the Lindadinia Tan, Conius, Tier Hain. And I'm just saying, in Irish as well, too, is so important for the people who are here living in their own country that they can do that. Okay. Jim Minister, you want to come back in again? I do. I want to ask why the £261,000 was spent before legislative approval was even sought for this provision? Okay. Um, sorry. Um, in order to be able to um, put in place the legislation, the, um, for it to go live, we would have to be able to provide the service. So once the legislation is in place, it goes live. When it goes live, people would expect to come in that day and be able to do it. Um, and obviously, it takes a number of months to plan to do discovery phase to work out exactly what it is, what are the changes are that are required, and then to um, make those changes to the system and then to test and test and test. So that's why it was done before um, the legislation um, is in place, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to provide the service on day one. So you took the assembly in this committee for granted? Yeah, that's right. No, I certainly didn't. I followed well, the procedure you, to make sure that the... expenditure of 261000 Sorry, I missed the question there. How did you authorise the expenditure of £261,000? A business case was written. Um, all the options were looked at to see whether or not what, what was the best options um, and the best way to provide this service. Um, and then the business case was approved. Sorry, Kathy, and just are there further Sorry, ongoing Jim, Jim, costs? Hold on, hold on, Chairman here. So, Kathy, who approved the business case? Um, actually, I did. It was within my um, remit, my allocation. Okay. So it was within your budget allocation? Yeah. And did you bid? But it was also within my, my um, um, allowance. No, um, different grades sure. can approve different amounts. Okay. And did I, you, did you I was sorry, asking sorry, just whether wait. ongoing costs. Jim, Jim, excuse me. Jim, well, right. I'm speaking. So you put that through as your business case. So you... Had you previously bid for those monies of two hundred? Because that's a uh, sir, from, uh, sir, just point of order. I, I, well, uh, it's within the official's business case or mind. She's followed the procedure for it, and I don't believe that we should be questioning that here of this committee. That's my opinion. Just burn, on burn money, Pat. Just burn it. Sorry. Sorry. Pardon? Burn money. Just Sorry. burn it. Gentlemen, excuse me. Okay. I'm asking a legitimate question. Because 261,000, regardless of where it is, is a significant amount of public monies. The fact that 261,000 pounds has been allocated for this role, whether it's correct or not, is not the point. It's the point that it's 261,000 pounds. The question I have asked, as chair of this committee, because this is public monies, okay? It's a legitimate question to ask on public monies. Is this was this part of the business case? What, is, and at what percentage of the budget is that actually of? You've already been in, sir, through to yourself, and you've already been informed that it, it was agreed within the competence of the official. That was agreed, and she was allowed to spend it through a business case for a procedure which is coming forward. It's called forward planning. You have to do it every day in your own old job as well, as I had to as well. 
So there's something coming forward, and I don't think that we should be questioning our official here today on that procedure or how That's that our role, Pat. We need to that go back. is our right. role. Right. Right. Not, not, not on how that decision yes, was made. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. What are we sitting here for? £261,000. That's eight nurses' salaries burnt to allow 20 I'm people sure a year to register nurse. That. That's a disgrace. Right. Right. Gent- yeah. Gent- Gent- yeah. uh, gentlemen, let's take it down yeah. a notch. So just wait, Militia. Let's take it down a notch. Okay. This committee is not known for screaming and yelling at each other. I apologise. Okay. That's, 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 that, that. Here we are, team. There is, a, there is a question there. It is about the £261,000. And I think, I think we all must consider that a quite a surprising figure to be, uh, to be announced upon. So regardless of whether we consider it a useful amount of money or not, it is the fact that it is £261,000. Sorry, just wait one minute. So therefore, okay, we shall move on from this question. I'll withdraw my question to you, um, uh, Cathy, having heard what sort of Pat has said. However, I do Jim. have considerable... Jim, wait. I do have considerable reservations about the idea of £261,000 has been allocated, even if part of it's a business case, on a piece of legislation that hasn't been passed. I mean, what other, where else, where else would we have heard this of somebody of spending an allocation of money for legislation that hadn't been passed in the presumption that it was going to be passed? I th- I, look, that is, that is the concern I have. It's not a particular piece of legislation. And the fact is, I will be voting for the statutory rule when it comes from, so don't think that yeah, this is something fair. to do with uh, my views on the Irish language or not. This is to do with a quarter of a million quid, which I find sort of quite surprising. But that's, that's where we're at at the but, moment. Chair, on the back of your question, I, I think that it would be fair to also ask to find out how much to set in place uh, that IT system is in order for it to come out in English. So that would be fair in order to, <laughs> to look at both Everybody of them. Everybody wants it in English. Pardon? Everybody speaks English, Pat. They all want it in English, apart from 20 people. Yeah. No, that's not yeah. 20 people. Yeah. That's very unfair, Jim. Okay. Yeah. That's unfair. Right. Sir, team, I'm going to use the... I'm going to use the chair's discretion here. Right. We need to get, we need to get to the point where, obviously, we're going to disagree on this legislation. And we can sit and argue about the money to where we come from. But the reality is we need to get to the point about whether we agree to this legislation or not. Chair, yeah. I want to ask, is there a future Chair, ongoing Sorry, clause? Chair, I've Sorry, been Sorry. In, in, Philip first, then Alicia, then Jim. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jim Wells has made th- this point about 20 people a number of times there. I, I don't know how, I mean, you, you made the comment it's nothing to do with your dislike for the Irish language. Well, I, I think I can gather that it's certainly down to his dislike of yes. the Irish language. Yes. He's made a number of inaccurate comments in this meeting. The system isn't up and running yet, so I don't know how he can quantify how many people are likely to use it or avail of that service. So, you know, it, it's clear his contribution is because he wants to discriminate against Irish language and Irish language speakers. And I, for one, will not support anything that does of the sort. Okay, thanks for that. Alicia? Yeah, and I would just make the comment too that uh, people are putting up straw men here whenever they start quoting this figure, 12 people are going to use. When the question was put to the official, she actually acknowledged herself that they didn't know. So how anyone else can uh, uh, put a figure on that, they don't know. And they won't know until the facility is available and to see how many people does are going to actually use the facility. I make another comment as well too, and it's a considerable amount of money, £261,000, Yet, at the same time, you know and I know that even if I went to the local O2 shop and had the, uh, the, the front of my phone replaced, it's going to cost me 50 or £60. Pounds. So to develop or to adjust even within an IT system, it's going to cost money. And in order to uh, provide that equality of opportunity for all of the people that live here in the north of Ireland in terms of the language that they use uh, day and daily, their native tongue, then we do know it will incur a certain cost, and in particular in relation to IT systems and themselves. Go along and make the, the, the smallest of adjustments, and you know as well as I do, it will cost. But once again, and I'd like to endorse just what Philip has implied there, that this discussion is more reflective of um, it's a bigotry uh, against uh, the sorry, language. I, I'm sorry, sorry, again, sorry, through the 
Please withdraw, withdraw that word, bigotry. Bigotry. Well, I, I was trying to find the right word for this, you okay. know, but it's a, it's a, a totally, it's an anti-Irish, it's a reflection of an anti-Irish attitude in every aspect of Irishness that is here, uh, both in this house and on this island as well. Too. Your point has been noted, Jim, Alistair. Yeah, well, I, if I can make a comment and ask a question, if this was about facilitating people in their native language, then we would have proposal before us about Polish and all sorts of things, which we don't. But my fir- my question was, is there an ongoing cost with this? And if so, what is it? Okay. No, there's no ongoing cost for this because when you produce a certificate, whether it be in English, Irish or dual language, it will be the same price for us to produce that certificate. And it will be the same price for somebody purchasing that certificate. Just one, Thank final, you. Just, just one final question, Cathy. Uh, through this committee, we have had numerous meetings with, uh, on discussions about IT systems and costs for upgrading, and particularly within sort of a, another part of the finance department that had significant problems with uh, IT upgrades and the rest of it. Um, which company did the upgrade for £260,000, or is that commercially sensitive? Um, it's the incumbent. Um service provider at the moment, um, although we have just gone out to tender BT. to BT. BT. Yes, it's the incumbent <laughs> um, supplier, yes. So we have literally just gone out to tender for our new contract and um, we're in the process now of, of uh, looking at those tenders for moment. a new contractor. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Oh. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy, for that. And I think um, uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, giving your evidence. I think it was uh, uh, interesting and illuminating, but uh, uh, keep yourself safe. OK. OK, team. Thank you very much. Obviously, uh, we're now going to put Statutory Rule 2248. Uh, um, are members content? No, we're not. I didn't think, I didn't no, think that would be the case. Absolutely not. So, therefore, uh, I have to take a show of hands. So, I will first of all ask. The committee has considered Statute Rule 2248, the Marriage, Civil Partnership and Civil Registration Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2022, and subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules, have no objection to the rules. Those in favour, raise their hands. One, two, three, and... Oh, yeah, you've got jammers, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. Okay, thanks, Chair. That's... Okay. Okay. Those against? One, two. So that is carried. That's okay. Okay. Thank you. Right. Moving on to something completely uncontroversial. <laughs> Moving on to correspondence. Correspondence index with 15 items of correspondence to get through. Uh, the first item is the definition bill. The committee has asked to note of page 645 commentary from the Minister of Justice on possible amendments of the defamation bill in respect of the jurisdiction of the county court and use of the alternative dispute resolution. Uh, Jim, Alistair, do you want to say anything? Um, no, I don't. I think so at this point. At okay, this point. Yeah. Just to, to note, members, that the that, that neither of those amendments have been put down to the bill now. So they, those have been the notice of amendments was issued just before lunchtime there. So neither of them are down. Oh, right. Okay. So we're content right. to note, but none of them are down. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, the LCM Architects Act. The committee has also asked to note page 648 correspondence from uh, the Royal Society of Ulster Architects indicating that there is no objection to the LCM relating to the Westminster Building Safety Bill, which would give an enhanced role for the Architects Registration Board in respect of CPD, etc., for architects in Northern Ireland. The Department has advised that owing to the collapse of the executive, the LCM will not be progressed. Are we content to note the correspondence? Agreed. Yeah. Uh, external internal wall cladding. Uh, Keith's not Keith's here, is he? Not here. All right. mm. Okay. Uh, the committee is asked to note at page 651 a departmental response to committee queries regarding uh, regarding external internal wall cladding, fire safety issues. The department also advises that around 1,700 houses per annum require radon protection measures. Is the committee content to note this correspondence? Just all the fun noted. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, I uh, made a declaration on this one, Stormont and State of the Queen's Jubilee. The committee is asked to note at page 657 to Portmant will response to committee who carries regarding the Stormont Estate Review. Is the committee content to note this correspondence? Noted. <coughs> Stormont House. The committee is asked to consider at page 666. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the mark of the beast. Not saying not say, not say anything. <laughs> I'm ministerial. <laughs> Uh, 666 in the NIO. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a ministerial response to committee queries regarding Stormont House. The Northern Ireland Office is expected to leave on the 31st of March 2022. Are we content to note this correspondence? Noted. Please. Noted. In a declaration of interest, Ulster Grand Prix and North West 200, the committee is asked to also note on page 668 a ministerial response to the committee queries regarding the funding of the Ulster Grand Prix and North West 200. The business case was cleared subject to the conditions on the 16th of February 22. Are we content to note? It's gone to sure. the Department of Economy, hasn't it? Sorry, go ahead, Jim. Sure. I'd like to know what the conditions were. Yeah. Okay. So, um, right back to yeah. the Department of Finance. Okay. And I think it's. I might. Uh, just for clarity, I think the conditions were set, believe it or not, either by the Department of Economy. Or indeed by uh, uh, Northern Ireland Tourism, Tourism NI. Okay, and uh, the letter That's indicates it was the department, but okay, we will ask the yeah, department. If we can ask the question. Clarify. But I would also like to make sure, because of the importance of both the Ulster Grand Prix and the North West mm -hmm. 200, that it has actually gone through and they've got their money. Okay. Are we agreed with that? Agreed. Uh, good procurement practice. The committee has asked to note on page 671 departmental correspondence providing examples of good procurement practice. Obviously not for IT through BT. The booklet, <laughs> the booklet appears to show a very substantial increase in procurement which is being managed simply by CPD. Are we content to note this correspondence? Noted. Uh, red diesel use. Uh, the committee has also asked to note on page 681 a ministerial response in respect of concerns relating to red diesel use. Is the committee content to note this correspondence? Well, we're, not, we're not content. No, we're not. No. Um, it's, it's going to cause huge difficulties to, to the agriculture industry, boat users, quarrymen, contractors. And it's coming our way on the 1st of April. And indeed, one building company's estimate is going to cost them an extra £300,000 a year. Which will be passed on to the consumer, uh, and this this is an absolute disastrous piece of legislation. Um, and the HMRC simply do not understand the Northern Ireland context. As on the as back of that, chair, what's it going to cost for public contracts? Because that, all those costs will have to be passed on. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. That, remember, when this first came in front of this committee was a strange question was being asked about marine Oops. diesel. Yes. And how that has evolved to this position we are at at the moment. Yes, we were the one of the first to pick this up. The, the, the definition is that the boat owner can use, must use white diesel to get his boat around the lake or the river, but then must use red diesel to heat or cook. Yeah. Or how you do that is just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, would you think it would be worthy of us writing, uh, our con writing to our concerns, both to the, uh, uh, the minister, but also indeed to the Treasury? Okay. To just pointing out the sort of inconsistencies, and because the next item of correspondence is also uh, from the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, and Rural Affairs regarding uh, red diesel, just really outlining sort of the real implications of this, and that's likely to have. Yep, I support that. Sure. Right, the Treasury. Sorry. Yep. Go ahead, Jim. I, I would have thought HMRC because they're the ones going to be administering this. Make sure at the end of this there should be some economy of scale, proportionality issue, which seems to be totally absent from this. Yeah. Okay, right to okay. HMRC so, Treasury. Yep. Yep. Okay. And then that's uh, red diesel use also for item number 10. It's worth just saying on, on, the, on Jim's point, it, it, it will be the Treasury Minister who is responsible. Yep. There is going to be an exception made. It will be a political decision that has to be made by a Treasury Minister, not an HMRC official. Exactly. That's what we are writing to. Right, Chair. Okay. Sorry, Go ahead, think, Philip. I think we should use the, the letter that the Euro Committee got from them in response, because I mean, it was very dismissive yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. and, and totally unsatisfactory. So I think we should use some of that detail in our letter. Yeah. Are you content? Yeah. Yep. Cool. Okay, moving on to the next item of the correspondence, levelling up money. The committee is also asked to note on page 692 a copy of correspondence to the Minister for the Committee for the Economy seeking clarity on the new levelling up money, which has been allocated to Northern Ireland. Uh, do you want to say something about that, Matthew? I didn't, did you get to the um, uh, page six hundred ninety-two? I thought you might. I had a sneaking suspicion you might want to say something about it. Because I'm on the economy committee. Hmm? I, have, I haven't. Uh, because I'm on the economy committee. I mean, the levelling up white paper is ridiculous. It's uh, if that's what you mean. <laughs> it's not very <laughs> yeah. good. 
<laughs> that, that was that was my it's my view. <laughs> okay, right. and, there's no, and there's no guarantee that Northern Ireland is going to get anywhere near what the money for level we were would promised. So. Yeah. Okay. We're content to note the correspondence. Agreed. Subsidy control bill. The committee has asked to page 719 a copy of the correspondence from the EU Affairs Office providing a copy of the House of Lords correspondence to the Treasury regarding the impact of subsidy control bill on the procurement framework. Content to note? Great. Uh, Strategic Investment Board. The uh, committee is asked to also note on page 722 a response from the Control and Auditor General to the uh, committee, uh, committee for the Executive Office in respect of the Northern Ireland Civil Service use of SIB succumbents. Jim Alistair, do you want to uh, say anything to that? Well, I did mention it yesterday in the debate in the House. I think the SIB is one of those um, quasi-secret organisations that we know very little about. and. Um, I just don't find that there's much transparency or accountability with them. Okay, Matthew. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't agree with Jim and all that much, but I, I think he's right about that. Actually, I also think that the. Um, uh, I mean, I was. I guess it's an interest. I was on the uh, public accounts committee when the report on capacity and capability was published, and I think there is, you know, there's something for. There might there would be something for us if we weren't weeks away from the end of a mandate, mm-hmm. but there is a question about. Um, for me, you know, we know there's a, there are big structural issues with the civil service in terms of, um, uh, you know, no, they've just appointed a couple of permanent secretaries here from the outside, but we know we're awaiting to see kind of like what the actual civil service reform program is that was alluded to in NDNA. We know there are big issues around capacity and capability as outlined in the audit office report, um, but. At the minute, there seems to be this default use of the SIB as yeah. a kind of head, headhunter or something. So, like, is that written down in policy? What is? The, it's not clear to me what I'd like to hear from. You know, a senior person, Hox or the head of people or something, to explain what the on what basis they use the SIB by by default. Is that it just seems very um, uh, disordered? Are we content to note this until we get the SIB oral briefing later on in March? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Uh, next item on the agenda: Kismet Park and Sub-Regional Stadia. Uh, the committee is asked also to note on page 752 a copy of correspondence to the minister from the committee for the Executive Office regarding Kismet Park and Sub-Regional Stadia. Members will recall that the committee has written to the minister on related matters. Are we content to note the correspondence? Note. Nope. Noted. <coughs> Council tax rebate. The Council, the committee is also uh, asked to note on page 754 a copy of correspondence to the Minister from the Committee for Communities inquiring if the Council tax rebate consequential will be used to fund a domestic rates rebate. Are we content to note the correspondence? No. Noted. Uh, Chairperson's Liaisons Group. The committee is asked to consider at page 756 a copy from the Chairperson's li- or the, uh, the uh, Chairperson's Liaisons Group of the Strengthening Committee Scrutiny Report, including numerous recommendations. It's a big report, and there's a lot of issues in it. Um, have, have members had a chance to consider this report and in detail? No, I don't think so. No. Uh, so, therefore, does the committee agree to suggest that the report be supplemented with recommendations related to enhancing ass- assembly? Res- oh, sorry. Uh, we probably need to consider. Right, so we, I can put it back in again next week. Do the members want to do that, or shall the, or yeah. will the committee? Okay, I'll do okay. that. Then. Thanks very much. Next week. Thank do you. That. Okay. Uh, com- composite information request. Uh, composite re- information request is page 932. Uh, are we agreed that this is an accurate and complete record of our things? Yes, that's agreed. Uh, moving on to the forward work programme. The draft forward work programme is page 952. A copy of correspondence from the Speaker regarding the schedule of plenary business is page 954. Is the committee content to hold a short meeting next week to consider some secondary legislation and correspondence? There's quite a lot coming through. Agreed. Uh, the Department is scheduled to brief the committee on the 16th of March on the outcome of the consultation on the draft 22-25 budget. As it has been paused, officials have asked if this briefing can be cancelled. Instead, officials have offered to come on that date and explain how spending by departments will work in 22-23 in the absence of an executive. I think that's quite an important meeting yeah. to have. Do members want to alter the forward work programme accordingly? Great. 
Uh, the Fiscal Commission can't attend on either the 16th or the 23rd of March. They have offered to brief on Tuesday, the 22nd of March, at 1500. Is the committee content to have an additional meeting at that time to hear about the Fiscal Commission's final report? I think that's an important uh, report to have. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Is the committee content with the forward work programme as amended? Yes. So members, are we okay next week? It'll be a short meeting, probably about 30 minutes, with statutory rules and correspondence and such like, just to tidy up things that are they're coming in thick and fast from the department. If that's okay. 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 That's great. Very good. Uh, just before I go to any other business and date a time of next meeting, we are having a uh, we are having a private session immediately thereafter. It'll only take about five minutes. Okay. Okay. Any other business? Okay. Therefore, date and time of the next meeting next Wednesday, Wednesday at let's say two thirty. So the defamation bill consideration stage is due to be done at two. Let's say that it is. That would give members half an hour to have their lunch and then come here for uh, maybe a thirty or minute or so meeting to deal with statutory rules and correspondence, and that would be all. There'd be no briefings, just to keep up the speed with uh, with all of that. Because as I say, it's coming in thick and fast from the department. Okay. Happy. Okay, we're going to go into private session. Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber.